Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. DC fans, my peeps. <laughs> I was sitting here trying to figure out what story I was gonna do for a classic DC story because I'm not nearly as well versed in classic DC as I am with, you know, Marvel stories before all new, all different Marvel. And so I figured if I'm gonna do stories before the new 52, then I've gotta do something big, something that just pops. So I'm coming out, boom, 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 boom. Guns blazing. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, uh, a little bit of, of exposition, a little bit of lead up to this. So before Crisis on Infinite Earths, DC's continuity was an absolute mess. Not only that, uh, Batman's comics were on the verge of cancellation because they just couldn't get them to sell due to the restrictions from the Comics Code Authority. I actually have a video on that. There were all kinds of different things. A really good example is uh, Wonder Girl, Donna Troy. So when Wonder Woman had her publications and, and she was wildly popular, DC decided to take the Superboy approach. And what they did is they wrote a, a series of stories starring someone called Wonder Girl. And it was designed to be Wonder Woman when she was younger and the various adventures that she had. And the problem was that whether it was through miscommunication or a lack of concern, when the Teen Titans were launched, DC took the character of Wonder Girl and they threw her on the Teen Titans. And so it created continuity problems because the question fans had was, how could you have Wonder Woman as a girl and the stories are supposed to be her in the past, but she's currently in the present. And so instead they rewrote her origin story. And so that, and in conjunction with things like Earth 1, Earth 2, Earth 3, where you have the evil Justice League called the Crime Syndicate, it created all kinds of different issues fans didn't know where to start. And so in 1985, uh, under the writing of Marv Wolfman and the artistry of George Perez, DC said, everything stops. We're gonna reboot it all. We're gonna wipe the slate clean and we're gonna start over. And that was Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, uh, the way this starts, the way this picks up is we initially get this, this short little origin of the universe. Now there will be a huge explanation that we'll get later on, so don't worry. DC doesn't leave us hanging with the origin of the DC universe. Keep in mind, all this stuff is before the New 52. So this is all original content with the first reboot that they did. But uh, they basically tell us, you know, of course, in the beginning there was nothing and then we got the multiverse and there was an infinite number of Earths that came into existence, all of which were wildly different and they were totally changed. They had their own experiences and so on. Now, initially we pick up an Earth-3. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Earth-3 is essentially the opposite of virtually all other Earths that we saw. Uh, the main stories, main universes in this will be Earth-1, Earth-2, and Earth-3. Earth-3 is the crime syndicate of America, an evil version of the Justice League. And so instead of Wonder Woman, you have Superwoman. Instead of the Green Lantern, you have Power Ring. Instead of Superman, you have uh, Ultraman. And instead of Batman, you have Owlman. But they are basically villains. They're bad guys. The superhero on Earth three is actually a guy named Alexander Luther. Now, for those of you guys who read Infinite Crisis, the Alexander Luther that you recall is actually the child version that we'll see in this story that grows up rapidly fast. But the idea here is that we initially pick up with a guy named Pariah. Now, we'll find out more about Pariah later on, and he's actually, he's, it's actually kind of interesting the way his story goes. He's really like a scientist and an explorer, but basically he's being forced to jump to different realities and watch those realities die. Now, all Marvel Wolfman really gives us here in the beginning is just this idea that no one can save this universe, that Ultraman, the various members of the crime syndicate, they can't do anything to save their reality. That uh, this universe's version of Alexander Luther, who's married to Lois Lane, they can't save their reality. And so in a very Superman-esque sort of situation, once uh, this, this antimatter wave begins sweeping through all known existence, they quite literally send their child out. Now, the reason why I say this is Superman-esque is that with Krypton originally, you know, dying due to its own destruction, uh, the result was that the, uh, is that Jor-El sent his son, send Kal-El uh, into space and he arrived on Earth. And much the same way, they basically send him into the multiverse. Now, the reason why this is done is because before Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, Earth 1, Earth 2, and Earth 3 had crossed over before. And so it wasn't as though Alexander Luther had no idea what universes were out there. He had an inkling of an idea and he basically just kind of sent the child into space, more or less hoping for the best. And so what we do is we transition to the introduction of, uh, of two characters, or really the introduction of, of one character and the reintroduction of another. Uh, the character that we're reintroduced to is a girl named Lila. Now she's existed before. She first showed up in the Teen Titans, I believe, um, but she's basically reintroduced here as a girl named Harbinger. Uh, she's effectively someone that has the power of matter. She can just more or less manipulate matter, um, but she is an assistant of a guy named Monitor. Now, again, we'll get all this information here later on in terms of where they come from, but Marv Wolfman and George Perez are very uh, finicky, or not really finicky, they're very you know scant on information in the beginning. It's instead, it's more or less like reality 
facilities are ending and we're trying to save people. <laughs> and that's basically it. But what he does is he goes to Harbinger and he tasks her with finding heroes from across all space and time from whatever planets are left. And so it's just kind of like grab who you can from where you can and then bring them here. And that's exactly what she does. She creates duplicates of herself and she sends them across multitudes of times. So of course she goes to like Gorilla City, for example, on Earth, and she ends up grabbing their king. She goes to the 30th and 31st centuries and she grabs the Legion of Superheroes. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the Legion of Superheroes was a huge deal when it first came out. And because of the DC, one of the big issues they ran into in the, the early days of the publications is you had the Justice League, you had the Teen Titans, you had the Suicide Squad or what would become the Suicide Squad. And so it was like, you know, all the modern day teams were basically covered. And so the question was, well, well where do you go from there? If you've covered the modern day teams, you can only have so many heroes on so many teams because they don't have an infinite number of heroes. And so the question was, all right, well, let's, let's try something different. And so they went to the future basically, and they said, here is a superhero team in the 30th and 31st centuries called the Legion of Superheroes, and it was wildly popular. And so what they did is they started crossing them over with the Teen Titans and some of Earth's other heroes, and it just bolstered their popularity even further. And so what we end up doing is we end up grabbing a girl named Dawnstar, and then we just join the rest of Harbinger's clones as she starts grabbing other people. Now behind the scenes, and what we'll actually learn later on is, of course, because this story is, you know, 30 years old, uh, what we end up finding is that uh, the Anti-Monitor, who of course, again, we'll get a little more exposition about him, a little more explanation on his origin, um, he has what are called shadow demons. And shadow demons uh, are more or less henchmen that work for him. And we'll see them, you know, as we progress through this story. But one of the shadow demons uh, latched itself on to one of the uh, duplicates of Harbinger. And so when she eventually reconsolidated herself, it resulted in her basically having a fraction of the anti-monitor inside of herself. And what it does is it creates this dichotomy where the side of her that's influenced by the anti-monitor says, kill the monitor. And the side that's influenced by the monitor doesn't want the monitor to die. And so it's, it'll play out in an easy to understand way as we get through this. But again, this is really just her grabbing people as they can. Now, one of the most important people that she grabs is a guy named Psycho Pirate. Now, Psycho Pirate has the ability to manipulate the emotions of others. And initially, it didn't seem like it was going to be that big of a thing. It didn't seem like it was going to be that significant. But we'll find that when Psycho Pirate is joined by Barry Allen, when he's taken by the Anti-Monitor, uh, the acquisition of Psycho Pirate by Anti-Monitor turns out to be one of the most important things that he grabs here. But again, Harbinger basically just, you know, just, just takes Psycho Pirate and uh, initially seems to whisk him away to the layer of the monitor. And so what we do here is we basically join um, a lot of these pre-crisis heroes. For example, Superman from uh, Earth 2, which is basically the golden age of superheroes. So Alan Scott, the Green Lantern, um, you know, Jay Garrick, the Flash, they're not here, but that's the era of heroes that they come from. Uh, this is basically the original Superman from Action Comics number one. Uh, we also have Ted Cord, Blue Beetle. Uh, we have a handful of others, the Green Lantern, John Stewart. It's basically just heroes grab from different points in time, and they're all initially brought here. Now, they don't really know why, and in fact, a lot of them seem to uh, seem to argue amongst themselves, some of which is due to the fact that Psycho Pirate starts manipulating them, but also because of the fact that some of these, uh, these shadow demons start showing up out of nowhere and start attacking these various heroes. Now, eventually, they ask the question, what's going on here? You know, whoever you are, reveal yourself, and the monitor basically shows up and says, hey, this was somewhat of a test. I wanted to see whether or not you can handle the task that I'm going to, to bestow on you because all of your universes are getting ready to die. And so what we do here is we initially pick up with a uh, with a young boy. We pick up with a guy whose name is Anthro. And Anthro hails from a future whereby humanity has been pushed to the brink of extinction. Now, he's not the most important character ever in the history of, of stories. But the only reason why I mention him is because we'll eventually pick up with Superman uh, here in a little while and we'll join him. And I didn't simply want you to be without any explanation of, of who that guy is. But what happens here is there's basically this sort of um, shuffling, this, this, you know, mixing up of time and space in the sense that we have Anthro who witnesses the 30th century before it immediately disappears. We have, uh, you know, people in the in the 30th century who were suddenly met with the arrival of woolly mammoths who are just time displaced. That's really all that's happening is that time and space is being disheveled and is being thrown awry. And so picking back up again with these various superheroes meeting with the Monitor, of course, again, their question is, why are we here? What's going on? You know, and he says, I've assembled you for the purposes of trying to help me defeat my foe. Now, the Monitor doesn't tell them everything that's going on. And in fact, he's very enigmatic to the to a lot of these heroes. There were stories that took place before this where the Monitor began providing arms and even the Mon uh, Anti-Monitor himself was providing arms, weapons, and so on to various people. But that was designed to be a test to see whether or not those heroes could fight for the Monitor and fight for the Anti-Monitor. It was basically them just kind of determining who would be best suited to fight on their own, uh, fight on each of their behalf. But the result is that the Monitor has basically created these giant pillars, these uh, energy towers. Now, those of you guys who read 
Now, I want to say it was Jeff John's Green Lantern that dealt with the Anti-Monitor coming under the control of the Black Lantern Corps. Uh, if you recall, maybe it was Infinite Crisis, I don't remember, but there was a giant tower that had the Anti-Monitor melted into it. This is where that comes from. Uh, this is where Jeff John's grabbed that kind of a thing. And so, again, we initially transition over to the Guardians of the Universe. Now, this is only a quick thing, and we actually won't see them again for a little while, but the Guardians of the Universe are actually the core reason for why this happens, for why we're having Crisis on Infinite Earths. Not them directly, but one of their guys named Krona. And so even though, you know, Marv Wolfman only gives us a small glimpse, even though he has them analyzing this antimatter wave and realizing it seems there's nothing they can do, but they have to try their best. And while they are imprisoned or they're kept in stasis, um, I'd like you to keep them in the back of your head because they're going to be wildly important. And so from here, we jump to Earth One. Now, Earth One is basically the universe that exists after the introduction of Barry Allen. And so all the superheroes that you see that Barry Allen fights alongside, Superman, Wonder Woman, so on and so forth, those are Earth One characters. The superheroes that, you know, the Green Lantern Alan Scott, I guess, fights alongside, that is Earth Two. So hopefully that can help you guys differentiate things. But uh, but again, we basically join these heroes as they've been dispersed throughout all space and time to guard these towers that have been created by the Monitor. Now, we don't exactly know why a lot of this was done, but we suddenly realize that the Monitor is met with the arrival of Alexander Luther from Earth Three, the last survivor of his universe. Now, initially it's just kind of monitoring him. It's really just keeping an eye on him, watching what happens, but the Monitor is also curious about Alexander Luther because he's aging so fast, but also because he has such a high intelligence. Now, transitioning back to some of these superheroes uh, who are who are monitoring these towers, you know, keeping an eye on these towers and defending them, of course, again, Pariah makes his presence known. Now, with Pariah showing up here, it's basically just another instance where he's being forced to watch a, watch a universe's destruction, and that's exactly what happens. Uh, this is, you know, where initially we believed that it would be kind of like a last battle at the Alamo, where Earth 1 is where this final battle would take place between the Monitor and the Anti-Monitor or the Anti-Monitor and the Superheroes or something like that. Instead, that doesn't happen. Uh, effectively, all this stuff gets wiped out. Earth 1 gets annihilated, Earth 2 gets annihilated, but it's really going to be this mass panic that we'll start to realize here in a second. But again, we also transition back to uh, Anti-Monitor as he's taken Psycho Pirate captive. Now, the interesting thing about this is we don't see the Anti-Monitor until about halfway through this story. Instead, the Anti-Monitor is just kind of this, uh, this, this disembodied voice that communicates with Psycho Pirate. And the question Psycho Pirate has is, why am I here? And Anti-Monitor says, because you're the most important piece of the board. Now, losing Psycho Pirate for the Monitor is a huge deal. And we'll find out why, because again, it, it, it really seems to change everything. But picking up with Earth One, which is the comic book universe that you guys are most familiar with, is basically the elimination of all things. And it's really people trying to understand what's going on. You have Wonder Woman, Donna Troy, you have Dick Grayson, Nightwing, uh, you have Superman, you know, you have all these heroes that are that are trying to figure things out. Batman doesn't even really know what's going on, but in truth, this antimatter wave is sweeping throughout this cosmos so fast that none of them really have time to react. And so while Flash, you know, reappears to them after having vanished previously and says, hey, look, we have to find a way to stop this. Like this world is going to end, but there's still a way to save things. He suddenly just disappears. He, he simply just vanishes and no one initially knows where he goes to. And so again, uh, Marv Wolfman really gives us an idea of just how grave this situation is just how many people are watching what's going on when we switch to Brainiac. Now, Brainiac is really just kind of out in space here. Uh, he's really just doing whatever it is Brainiac does when he's not fighting Superman <laughs> or attacking Earth. And he comes to this realization that there is an antimatter wave sweeping throughout the cosmos. Now, Brainiac, with his extremely advanced intellect, also realizes that this antimatter wave simply cannot be stopped. It doesn't seem as though there's a way to bring it to an end. But if there's anybody on Earth that may have a way to end it, it's Lex Luthor from Earth one. It's, it's the Lex Luthor the, that we are the most familiar with. And so what we do here is, again, we, we pick up with a couple of, uh, a few of the heroes here and there who are fighting against these various forces, some of whom are time displaced. They're thrown out of their own time period. They're thrown into a future time period or something like that. You know, we pick up with uh, like Ted Cord, Blue Beetle, um, who's trying to guard one of these uh, one of these towers, but they're also fending off against the uh, shadow demons of Anti-Monitor. It's really just uh, Marv Wolfman kind of giving us a quick run through of what's going on with a lot of these heroes. And the reason why he does this is is because while that's happening, we have the heroes on Earth-1 trying to understand everything and trying to bring everything to an end. And suddenly, we have Harbinger, who, who's basically taken over by the influence of the Anti-Monitor, who turns her weapons against Monitor and who annihilates him, who completely wipes him out. And so the question that people have now is what's going to happen? With Pariah having been thrown from universe to universe and watching each universe die and having been thrown into the presence of the Monitor, Pariah is nil 
is now in a situation where he believes that there's no way to save the multiverse. There's nothing that can be done. Now, something else that I also want to do here is I want to turn your attention to the new Dr. Light. Now, those of you guys who were following DC in the 1990s, you recognize this version of Dr. Light. I'm sure that you do. And the reason for this is because the monitor had this idea that there's basically going to need to be someone who can rally the heroes together or at the very least who can stand at the precipice really among the ranks. Now, the reason why I say this is because Dr. Light is exactly what it sounds like. It's, you know, in, in this instance, Dr. Light's able to manipulate all forms of light. But the reason why this matters is because the shadow demons of the Anti-Monitor have a weakness to light. And so what this would mean is that if all else fails, if these pillars were to converge into a single location, then Dr. Light would quite literally be able to fend them off by herself just by absorbing light from anything that emits light around her, absorbing that light into herself, and then just continually shining it and keeping the shadow demons away. It's really just a way for the monitor to buy time to keep the shadow demons gone. That's one of the reasons why I say Dr. Light would really be kind of like at the precipice of these heroes, because while they have to fight the shadow demons in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Dr. Light could defeat them in the most feasible way possible. And so again, we pick up here with uh, with a lot of these superheroes, you know, going against a lot of these different shadow demons. Again, it's really just kind of a way to uh, to show us exactly what's happening in this, in this point in time. But ultimately, we're basically met with Pariah uh, meeting alongside the monitor prior to his death and then having to witness the monitor die and so what we have is this situation where earth 2 and earth 1 basically seem to be gone that the multiverse in its entirety seems to have been completely eliminated and so the question that we have is if this is the case if the antimatter wave of the anti-monitor was successful in eliminating the entirety of the multiverse then what are, what have happened to these heroes what's going on and what we learned was that you know the monitor dying was part of his plan and the reason for this was because the vast powers that he possessed, you know, to manipulate reality in its entirety were limited by his physical body. And so after his death, he basically reveals a hologram image or a recording to uh, to Lila, to Harbinger, and to Pariah, and he says, this is this was my plan, that by destroying my physical body, you've released my energies into what remains or what used to be existence, and what I've done is I've basically created something called the Netherverse. And the Netherverse is essentially like this little sliver, a little pocket dimension. Uh, it's, it's very akin to Battle World from Secret Wars, for those of you guys who read that story, and it's essentially a place where he's gathered what remains of what he could grab and stored them there. And so there are heroes, there are planets, uh, there are uh, locations that exist from the remainder of the multiverse prior to its collapse that have all been stationed here. The problem with this is that it's people from all spaces and all times. And so you have dinosaurs in the 30th century, you have soldiers from World War II who are in the modern day. They're seeing things they've never experienced before. Now, initially this wasn't a huge deal, but the most notable hero heroes from throughout all space and time, all history of the DC multiverse have been gathered together under the direction of Harbinger and the now older uh, Alexander Luther, who's basically grown into really past adolescence, into his 20s or so, as well as Pariah. And when they bring them here, they basically say, yes, the actions of the Monitor, uh, you know, resulted in his death. Yes, that was part of his plan, but it's all left to us. And he says the only way they can basically win is, of course, to defeat the Anti-Monitor, or at least defeat whatever this foe is, but also to essentially create one universe. And this is basically where Marv Wolfman is coming along and saying, this is the purpose of Crisis on Infinite Earths. The purpose of Crisis on Infinite Earths is not to recreate the multiverse. The purpose of the story is to effectively eliminate the multiverse and then create one universe going forward. And so again, the other half of this is that because of the fact that Psycho Pirate has been brought before the Anti-Monitor and the moments before the multiverse was collapsing and the moments before its entire collapse and in the time it took between when it was collapsing and when the monitor grabbed whatever he could and brought them over to this netherverse, that anti-monitor had reached out and grabbed a character named Red Tornado. Now, those of you guys who were reading the New 52, or uh, those of you guys who read the Earth 2 line of stories in New 52, that name will sound familiar to you. Red Tornado will be familiar. And the reason why is because in Earth 2, in the New 52, Red Tornado was basically an android with female features that had the mind of Lois Lane inside of it. In the Crisis on Infinite Earth story arc, Red Tornado is its own being, it's its own entity. But what anti-monitor says is that instead of Red Tornado manipulating winds and so on and so forth, the Red Tornado was a vastly powerful being. Now, Red Tornado was effectively going to serve as part of uh, the Anti-Monitor's machine in creating this antimatter wave that's going to eliminate the Netherverse in its entirety with the intention of recreating the multiverse as an antimatter multiverse. That's really what uh, the Anti-Monitor is shooting for. We'll find out why here in a little bit. But with Psycho Pirate having been told that operating as a, as a henchman of the Anti-Monitor would mean that he would be able to basically 
basically manipulate a world of his own, or I guess, uh, you know, a reality of his own, that he's basically told, yes, this is exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get the ability to manipulate realities of your own. And this is where we get the actual uh, plan of the Anti-Monitor. What he does here is he basically bolsters the power of, uh, of Psycho Pirate. Psycho Pirate's ability to manipulate emotions are now planetary level, really, you know, universal level. And what he does is he basically has the Anti-Monitor tap into the emotions of all these people who exist on the fragments of realities in this netherverse and essentially manipulate their emotions and uh, start turning them against one another. Now, while this happens, we also have the Guardians of the Universe that are still alive in the netherverse. And we also have Ultron, which is still alive in the netherverse. And it grabbed Lex Luthor from Earth One. And so it was really more of this thing where when the multiverse collapsed, the monitor had just reached out, grabbed people wherever they happened to be at that time and brought them into the netherverse. And so things are pretty much the same as far as they remember for those who were out in space and weren't actually on planets. But again, because of the fact that all these different heroes are fighting one another, we basically have like Shazam fighting against Supergirl. It's really one of these scenarios where it's kind of the dream matches that a lot of people always wanted to see, but it's also a less expansive version of the battle world events that we saw in Secret Wars from Marvel Comics. And so what we have here is uh, is essentially Lila coming to this realization that the influence of Psycho Pirate is dependent on his power boost from the Anti-Monitor. And so in order to keep everybody from fighting themselves, she basically burns her powers out. What she does is she essentially moves the entirety of the Netherverse away from the influence of the Anti-Monitor. And while it does restore things to normal, she's inherently human now. She has no superpowers. She's basically burned them all out in an attempt to essentially keep everybody alive. And so with the destruction of the Monitor's Fortress, the question that everybody has now is what's next? Not only that, they also have a lot of questions that haven't been answered on who the Monitor was, who their actual foe is, how all this stuff works, and what exactly is taking place. And so what Marv Wolfman does is he effectively gives us this sort of end-all be-all origin of all things. And what he tells us is that when this universe came into existence originally, there was only one universe. There was only one DC universe, which we could call Earth-1. But what had happened was somewhere along the line after the guardians of the universe once the once the owens basically kind of elevated themselves in science and so on and so forth one of their kind a guy named crona wanted to witness the origin of all things but it was forbidden but despite this fact he used a computer to witness the origin of creation and in doing so not only gave birth to the multiverse but also gave birth to the antimatter universe now what this did is this basically created two opposing sides the evil antimatter universe and the good or at least for lack of a better word good uh positive matter multiverse Multiverse. In response to this, the, the Owens formed themselves or christened themselves as the Guardians of the Universe. They imprisoned uh, Krona and they set about basically correcting the error of their mistakes, looking for a way to create superheroes or looking for a way to create a, a police for the universe that could basically offset this introduction of evil. And so what they did is they initially created the Manhunters and when the Manhunters proved to be a failure, they created the Green Lantern Corps. Now behind the scenes, we also had a group of Owens who didn't necessarily see things the exact same way the Guardians did. Instead, where the Guardians wanted to use the Green Lanterns as a peacekeeping force, some of the Owens wanted to use them as soldiers, getting rid of what they called undesirables. The problem with this was that the term undesirables was an open term. There was really no definition on what undesirables meant. And so the Guardians saw this as the first steps to creating uh, a dicta you know, dictatorial universe. And so instead, they basically engaged in a civil war with these uh, other Owens that, you know, had really harsh views. And as a result, the Guardians of the Universe maintained control over the uh, positive matter multiverse and they in turn they sent the evil Owens off to the antimatter universe where they took up residence on a uh, on a planet called Cord. Now while they were on this planet Cord, they effectively evolved into what we call the weapon ears. That's where these came from. But while all this had been happening when the multiverse had been formed the monitor came into existence and when the uh, antimatter universe had been formed the anti-monitor came into existence. The kicker was that they had just slept. They were basically dormant but eventually the anti monitor woke up. Now we weren't initially told how, but what we learned was that this is why Pariah is more or less being forced to witness all these things. It's kind of the penance that he's paying. Pariah was a scientist much like Krona. The issue was that when he set about exploring the origin of creation, he inadvertently woke up the anti-monitor. And when he did, the anti-monitor destroyed his world and then began a conquest to basically start wiping out everything and absorbing all the antimatter energy in existence to make itself this absolute ruler with the purpose of wiping out all things 
things in existence and then recreating the universe or the multiverse as an antimatter multiverse. And so in response to this, the Monitor started realizing what was going on and they fought one another, which ultimately leads us up to where we are right now. So what this does is it basically creates the status quo. It tells us where things are at this moment and it gives us the origin of the DC universe before Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now something to keep in mind is that for those of you guys who jumped into DC Comics with like the Justice League Dark Side War, the information that you found in there gets rid of all this stuff. It basically replaces all this stuff. It's what's called a retcon or retroactive continuity where a writer comes back and they change the status quo with regards to what it is that they're doing. And that's essentially what, what he did. Of course, there, there's a lot of things that go into that, but that's more or less the, the gist of this. In addition to all this kind of stuff, this, this exposition, we're also met by the arrival of the Phantom Stranger and the Spectre. Now, the Phantom Stranger is like this enigmatic being that's just wildly powerful. And no one's ever really explored that as far as I know. We don't really know the full heights of his abilities. We don't really know anything about him. That's why he's called the Phantom Stranger is he has the capability to do, or at least it seems though he can do almost anything. He just never really does. When it comes to Jim Corrigan, when it comes to the Spectre, he's like the wrath of God. But one of the kickers to this, and it may have been something that I that I missed, I'm not really sure, but one of the kickers here seems to be that for whatever reason, the powers of Jim Corrigan don't really work to their fullest in the antimatter universe as it stands right now. Now, it seems as though the reason behind this is because the antimonitor has just absorbed so much antimatter energy that it basically just negates the powers of, uh, of Jim Corrigan. That seems to be the case, but we're not entirely sure. At least I'm not entirely sure. Again, if you guys know something that I don't, feel free to post it down in the comment section below. But uh, moving on to Alexander Luther, the reason why his character was so important here is that when he passed through the dimensional barrier between uh, the time it took for him to get from Earth-3 prior to his, uh, to his destruction and arriving in the realm of the Monitor, he had basically become like a living energy conduit. Uh, he has the ability to harness both positive and antimatter, and in turn, he can basically create portals to anywhere, and he can create dimensions. And that's, that's what he does. And in fact, this will be a major component when it comes to the end of this story with regards to Superboy Prime, to Earth 2 Superman, to Earth 2 Lois Lane, and even Alexander Luther himself, which will actually be picked back up once you guys get into Infinite Crisis, which is where all that kind of stuff comes from. But we'll talk about that once we get, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But because of the fact that the Anti-Monitor still resides in the Antimatter universe, and they're more or less just kind of left in this no man's land of the Netherverse, Alexander Luther says, okay, fine, I will create a portal. I'll create a way for us to access the Antimatter universe, and we will go there and we will fight the Anti-Monitor directly. And that's exactly what they do. Now, interestingly enough about this is is that the, the villains actually have their own plans and it actually kind of works and we'll get to that here in a second but we end up joining these superheroes as they immediately get in to the antimatter universe but what marv wolfman does is he also provides some caveats here specifically when it comes to the various members of the superman family supergirl superman from earth one superman from earth two the issue with them is that they basically lost their invulnerability their super strength remains their flight their you know heat vision all that stuff's still there but it's basically just marv wolfman taking away from making these characters a day of sex machina, you know, where they can just basically end the entire situation. Because in truth, any foe that Superman from Earth 2, that Supergirl, Kurt zor goes against, that uh, Superman from Earth 1, if they were to fight them all, you know, fight that being with all three of them fighting at the same time, they would probably lay waste to the Anti-Monitor. And so by giving them a weakness, making them, uh, you know, easy to, to kill, basically, by losing invulnerability, it makes it possible for the story to have a compelling ending. And so uh, while they do face off against some of these threats of the Anti-Monitor, what I want to do here is I want to transition away from these various superheroes and I want to move over to the death of Kara zor -El. Now, the death of Kara zor -El was huge when this happened. I mean, this was uh, this was nuts because when, when she first appeared, she had a huge following. A lot of people really, really liked her. The kicker was a lot of people also saw her as like a spinoff of Superman. Now, that started to go away as she began to grow in the sense that while she was technically a spinoff, she also developed her own character and it was also done really, really well. But one of the questions people had is how powerful is Supergirl in relation to Superman. And people always said, well, Superman's more powerful. What Marv Wolfman did in this story is he said, while Anti-Monitor was facing off against all these heroes, while Anti-Monitor was taking all of them out one by one, Kara zor was the last man standing. She was the one, the last person who was able to fend off against the uh, Anti-Monitor and held out the longest. And so what, what Marv Wolfman basically said here is that between Superman Earth-1, between uh, Superman from Earth-2 and Kara zor from Earth-1, she's the most powerful out of all of them, the most capable. And it's a solidify what a lot of people liked about her character, but it solidified what a lot of people wanted too. And so what happens here is that with her death, Superman from, from Earth-1 loses it because this was his cousin. This was a part of his family. And he's so outraged and so distraught at the experience, you know, that he feels like he should be the one that should lay her to rest. He should be the one that should take her out and give her a proper burial in, uh, you know, what remains of the Fortress of Solitude. Because again, all these different Earths,
Jesus are still confined within this netherverse. And so from here, I want to jump over to Barry Allen, to the death of Barry Allen, because this is one of the other huge things to happen in the story. Barry Allen's character had basically been popping in and out of time throughout this story. And I had actually skipped over that. And the reason why was because it would have seemed weird and out of place. And I was afraid it might've thrown you guys off. But since his capture by the anti-monitor, Barry Allen has basically been manipulated time and time again by Psycho Pirate and effectively just tortured to the point where Barry Allen has to remember these terrible experiences. He has to remember the happy experiences that he can never go back to. And it's really just a way to mess with his mind. At the same time, we also have Darkseid from the New Gods and Apocalypse, which exist in this netherverse. Now, Darkseid in this situation is actually really intriguing because he doesn't actually do anything. And that's one of the funny situations here is because we would expect someone as capable as Darkseid to either ally himself with the Anti-Monitor or ally himself with the superheroes. But in some form or fashion, he would fight. Instead, he says, nope, we're going to stay hands off and we're going to wait. And the reason why is he says, if the superheroes are successful, things will go back to the way they used to be. And I'll be doing the exact same thing I did before. If the superheroes are not successful, they would have put up one hell of a fight, which means that Anti-Monitor would be weaker, which means I can defeat him and I can recreate reality the way that I want it to be. And so for him, it's really just a waiting game. It's just an intelligent game to play to see how things end up. And so again, you know, with Barry Allen picking up with his character, uh, he had basically been kind of stirring in his powers because they had gradually been coming back while they had been suppressed during his time under the control of the, uh, the Anti-Monitor. And when he makes his escape, he's able to easily subdue a Psycho Pirate here. And he immediately takes off to the core of this antimatter cannon that the Anti-Monitor has assembled because the goal of the Anti-Monitor is to use this cannon, fire it into oblivion and recreate all things. And so Barry Allen comes to the realization, of course, as a scientist, that if this cannon is composed of antimatter, then it's going to take a sufficient amount of positive matter to basically destroy it. And so his idea is to basically reverse the polarity of this cannon by running in the, the direction counter to where this cyclone's going. And so he basically creates a, a wind tunnel effect that reverses the spin of this antimatter cannon, effectively dispersing the antimatter in its entirety and destroys the cannon. But in the process of doing this, he starts fluctuating throughout all space and time. And this is why those of you guys who uh, go and read Crisis on Infinite Earths, you'll see moments where he just pops up and he sees Batman for a second and says, hey, you have to save us and then vanishes. This is likely what's happening with regards to uh, the Batman Superman movie when we saw the Flash appear out of nowhere. This is the kind of thing that was taking place as he was basically fluctuating throughout all space and time. But ultimately his actions are successful in destroying the antimatter cannon. The problem is that he simply ceases to exist. Now, when this story happened, the initial belief was that Barry Allen died. That was the thought process. Barry Allen's gone, he's dead, and he's never coming back. As we found out with Final Crisis, he was basically just lost in the speed force. That was really all that was going on. And so because of this, it's really just kind of like this last man standing. It's, it's this, this final battle, or at least it seems to be this final battle that's taking place between the superheroes that remain and, uh, you know, those, those people who are basically trying to take their place, or at least villains, who are just doing villain stuff. Now, the kicker with this is that when it comes to the regular super villains that we're used to, they have their own plan in the sense that the only way to keep this cycle from repeating is to go back in time and to stop Krona from observing the universe in the first place. The problem with this is that they're super villains. <laughs> so when they do that, when they travel back into the past and they try to stop Krona, they ultimately start fighting among one another, which results in Krona observing the origin of all things anyway. In addition to this, with these various forces who are fighting amongst themselves, Jim Corrigan pops up and says, hey, you guys have to stop this. You know, the Anti-Monitor is not dead. The Anti-Monitor is alive and we have to work to essentially destroy him. And from here, this is where things get a little weird. From here, we're suddenly met by the arrival of Superboy Prime. Now, this is really just Marv Wolfman throwing Superboy Prime into the story. There was uh, a story arc in, uh, I think it was DC Presents issue number 81. Um, and that explained where it was that he came from, which you guys can actually find that in my video on Superboy Prime Explained. But the fact is, is that he's here. Now, Superboy Prime is wildly powerful. In terms of the uh, remnants of these various Supermen who are left, Superboy Prime is the most powerful out of all of them. But the idea here is to basically find the Anti-Monitor and to eliminate him before he can, you know, uh, essentially try to wipe all things out or at least wipe out what's, what remains of these superheroes. And so because of the fact that Krona is able to witness the Anti-Monitor, I guess witness the creation of all things, because of the fact that the Anti-Monitor is able to travel back to the creation of all things, we learn that the hand that Krona witnessed was the Anti-Monitor's hand rising up. But the view screens that the villains are watching in the past uh, as they're standing alongside Krona, uh, it actually changes so that when Spectre and uh, the Anti-Monitor are fighting one another, that they see the hand of the Spectre and the Anti-Monitor. So it's basically just an idea of how this multiversal battle is influencing the origin of all creation. And so what ends up happening is that in this, this conflict between the Anti-Monitor and Spectre, uh, it results in the fracturing of reality as it seems to exist and everything comes crashing down. And 
and then it immediately reforms in the form of New Earth. Now, the kicker about this is that all these heroes have no histories. Uh, as far as the universe is concerned, this is day one, and they're all just here. And so there's no backstories. They have no origin stories. Um, it's almost as if the character had just been written and no nobody ever wrote a backstory for them. That's basically where we are right now. And so the stage is set. Marv Wolfman has made the slate. He set the stage for the origin stories that these characters will get after Crisis on Infinite Earths is over. But what we also learn here is that the Anti-Monitor is not necessarily dead. The Anti-Monitor's essence still exists. And so what we have is this situation where Superman from Earth 2 uh, realizes that his wife Lois Lane is dead. Superman from Earth 1, real, you know, knows that Supergirl is dead. The lies they had before are gone. And so they basically have to make do as best they can. Not only that, once the Anti-Monitor reconstructs itself, or at least uh, reconstructs its essence and begins reforming its physical body, the Superman from Earth 2 lashes out. Superman from Earth 2 has has had and had enough of, uh, of everything the Anti-Monitor is doing. And so what he does, and this is actually one of the most impressive displays of power in this story, uh, Superman Earth 2 just loses it and uh, ultimately just punches the absolute shit out of the Anti-Monitor to the point that it seems to disperse his energies in its entirety. Now, of course, we also have a lot of other superheroes who are fighting alongside him as well. Uh, but the goal here is that the Anti-Monitor's essence has effectively been completely obliterated. The Anti-Monitor has been completely destroyed. And so what this does is this allows the superheroes to begin trying to figure out what they're going to do next to try to get things sorted out. Now, with regards to those of you guys who read Infinite Crisis, this is where things uh, began to pick up. This is where you guys got Earth 2 Superman, uh, Superboy Prime, who ended up going on a rampage. This is where they came from. What happened was that with Earth 2 completely gone, you know, Alexander Luther reveals that Lois Lane is alive, that she has, had effectively been reborn with New Earth, but he had kept her hidden away from the danger so that she wouldn't be killed in the conflict because she would have been brought back, you know, exactly where all this, this, uh, all this was happening. And so when her presence is revealed, Field, Alexander Luther basically says, we're people without a home. We have nowhere to go. And so essentially he takes them all or whisks them all away to a pocket dimension. Now, originally this was supposed to be the end. This was going to be the end of, of, uh, of the Earth 2 Superman. This is going to be the end of Superboy Prime. This is going to be the end of the Earth 2 Lois Lane. Their stories were going to be finished and they were for 20 years until Jeff Johns brought them back in uh, Infinite Crisis. But as the story wraps up, all it basically says is that we're getting a start over. We're basically getting a refresh that these characters are going to start getting uh, their own origin story that with Barry Allen having been killed, that Wally West now takes his place due to the fact that he was his age was jump-started uh, when the new Earth was reformed. It's, it's essentially, you know, this idea that we have a continuation of a lot of the characters that we like, but the origin stories of where they came from are going to be told in publications coming after. So, finishing Green Lantern Volume 1, no fear. Um, I was going through a lot of the Green Lantern stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm like... I'm into to Blackest Night right now in terms of reading. Blackest Night is amazing. Oh my God, that story is so good. Sinestro Core War was stellar. I think Sinestro Core War is better, but it, they're, they're amazing stories. I mean, when you get to that level of storytelling, it's pretty much just easy to say they're both amazing. I mean, you're really getting into like nuanced differences, but um, getting going into to Green Lantern Core Recharge, of course, what that does is it basically focuses on the Green Lantern Core. So like Kilowog, the new Green Lanterns who are being trained, Guy Gardner, Kyle Rayner, John John Stewart, but it also kind of ties into the idea of Superboy Prime still being held by the Green Lanterns. And what I initially thought about doing was just kind of saying, hey, here's what happened to Superboy Prime, yada, yada, yada. But then I also kind of realized that in DC, there are like intrinsically great stories or stories that just kind of need to be told. And, and Infinite Crisis is a story that I've wanted to tell. And so what we're going to do in this video is we're going to run over Countdown to Infinite Crisis. Now, what Countdown to Infinite Crisis did is it was basically like a, an 85 page one shot, and it set the seeds for a lot of stories that we're coming after. Project OMAC, The Rand Thanagar War, Villains United, and I don't remember the last one. <laughs> I feel like the last one is the most important one, but the fact remains here that it basically just kind of set the stage for, for a handful of stories here and there, and it went forward with the idea of basically telling us, here are the, the events that led to the start of Infinite Crisis. Here's how it all kind of uh, kind of came together in a way that, that basically made something a little more cohesive. Day of Vengeance, that's the last one. There we go. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't remember that last title for the life of me. But this story almost focuses exclusively on, on Blue Beetle, but it's done in a way that makes sense. Now, for those of you guys who were reading uh, Justice League versus Suicide Squad, and you had a particular interest in like Maxwell Lord, and you were trying to figure out about his character where he basically kind of uh, became a major villain, what the story does is answer those questions. I mean, well, it really kind of lays the groundwork for answering those questions, but Superboy Prime and company don't really show up until like Infinite Crisis. But again, this kind of sets the stage for things that, that go on. And so we might be kind of picky and choosy based on, you know, what 
mini series we do, we'll probably just stick with only a couple of them and then we'll just jump directly into Infinite Crisis. But what this does is it initially just kind of picks up with Blue Beetle making his way into the headquarters of Checkmate. Now, because this was a countdown to Infinite Crisis, it really just kind of followed the trend of Zero Hour Crisis in Time in the sense that Zero Hour Crisis in Time was actually a mini series where instead of going to issues, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, it started with six and worked its way down to a zero issue. And that's what this little story does. It really just kind of, you know, jumps back in time. So what we end up doing here is we basically jump back to four days ago. Now, of course, Ted Core, the current version of Blue Beetle, of course, hanging out with Barbara Gordon, who again is still paralyzed following the events of The Killing Joke, again, is basically alerted to the idea that somebody is uh, funneling money. Somebody's laundering money through through Ted Cord's company. The issue with this is that it basically kind of uh, is, is effectively bankrupting Ted Cord. And so, of course, this kind of leads him on a merry chase where he's trying to figure out what's going on. But again, it kind of sets the stage because keep in mind, Infinite Crisis was billed as like the 20th anniversary of Crisis on Infinite Earths. It was one of those things where it's like, if you read any story, you got to read this one. And so Countdown was basically designed to introduce new readers. So we get this sort of tour. So we basically transition over to, uh, to Booster Gold. Now, a lot of this comes out of Identity Crisis. And Identity Crisis basically dealt with a pretty severe situation with a woman named Sue Dibney. In order to keep it family friendly, we're not going to go too, do, uh, too deep into it, but Comic Storian does have a video on it. Suffice it to say, the, the incident basically involved sexual assault, we'll leave it there. But in response, the memories of a lot of superheroes of almost the entire Justice League were basically wiped. And so what this did is it basically created a rift with regards to a lot of the different members, creating trust issues among them. But what Blue Beetle does is he kind of gives us this little bit of a roller coaster in terms of how he viewed himself alongside Booster Gold. Because when Booster Gold and Blue Beetle came on, they were part of Justice League International. And again, Justice League International was the reworked Justice League team following Crisis on Infinite Earths. Remember, after, uh, after Crisis was over, there was no like main Justice League. There was no Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Lantern, and so on. There, there was no Justice League team like that. Instead, it was just the unsellables. I mean, I hate to use that term, but it was basically the characters that couldn't hold a book on their own. But it was a way for DC to basically treat the Justice League like a revolving door, introduce new superheroes that people would normally never read, give them some exposure, and then turn around and give them their own solo series if they proved to be popular. The funny thing about this was that Blue Beetle was basically, or I guess really Blue Beetle and Booster Gold, were kind of like the one-two punch of comedy on the team. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people really loved the two of them together because it just kind of went together like, like, you know, peanut butter and jelly. I mean, they were just, they were, they were great in terms of how they functioned with one another. The problem is that after the events of Identity Crisis, Booster Gold had basically walked away from being a superhero. He said, I can't really do this anymore. Well, the problem was that all the gimmicks, all the money, all the, the draw and the, the pizzazz that went with him being Booster Gold basically went along with it. And so he was, for all intents and purposes, completely broke. Now, there were instances where he tried to kind of get back on his feet. And that's really what happens here. You know, Booster Gold draws the attention of Blue Beetle when Booster Gold basically, you know, draws 300 bucks out of an ATM machine using, you know, money that, that Blue Beetle has. Of course, Blue Beetle says, hey, look, we're kind of broke here and I'm, we're running on fumes in terms of cash. But Blue Beetle also says, look, somebody's embezzling money. Somebody's laundering money through my company. And if there's any one person that would be most likely to do this, it would be Maxwell Lord. Now, keep in mind, Maxwell Lord was basically kind of uh, kind of brought in with regards to Justice League International as a guy that effectively stole leadership away from Batman. I mean, he really just kind of hijacked the team, but it was really cool because Maxwell Lord was kind of a, one of these characters that DC was trying to sort out. They were trying to figure out what direction they were going to take him in. And they struggled time and time again because Maxwell Lord was not inherently interesting. But what this does is kind of turn, take his character and turn him on his head again. Now, of course, getting with Maxwell Lord, meeting with Maxwell Lord, the, the meeting's pretty short lived in the sense that Lord basically says, look guys, your best years are behind you. I mean, you guys got to stop looking at being superheroes. You guys got to basically just kind of look at the future and see what direction you want your lives to go in. Well, there's really no answers to be had here. And so what ends up happening is, uh, is Booster Gold, I'm sorry, Blue Beetle basically turns his attention to Bruce Wayne. And that's really what's going to happen in the story. Blue Beetle is going to go from Justice League member to Justice League member telling them what's going on. And none of them are really going to take him seriously. Keep in mind that when it came to Booster Gold and when it came to, to Blue Beetle, they were playing second fiddle. I mean, when people thought of the Justice League, when they thought of the world's greatest superheroes, they didn't think of Ted Kord. I mean, you know, they didn't think of Blue Beetle. They didn't think of Booster Gold. I don't mean in terms of fans. I mean, in terms of just society in the DC universe. And so because of that, you know, they thought of, you know, Batman and so on and so forth. And so, you know, Ted Core, I guess uh, Blue Beetle, Booster Gold, they were background guys. They were second, second rate guys. And even the Justice League looked at them that way to a degree. However, speaking with Batman and basically saying, hey, look, you know, somebody's doing something. I mean, there's information that's going on, rumors about Dr. Light, so on and so forth. Again, all of that tying into identity crisis, Batman really kind of blows them off. But what we end up finding out is that because of the events of identity crisis, Batman had basically created this sort of autonomous system called Brother Eye. And what Brother Eye was designed to do was basically monitor the planet Earth. I mean, really kind of be one of these, you know, Batman's eye in the sky, so to speak, to kind of make the Earth, I guess, a, a 
safer place. Now, again, we're going to find out later on in this video how it can be used for nefarious purposes. But again, jumping back over to, to Blue Beetle, you know, in the present moment right now, investigating really the, the headquarters of Checkmate, he's coming across all these different files belonging to Batman, Superman, you know, the, the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. Keep in mind, this comes after Green Lantern Rebirth, you know, investigating the Flash and so on and so forth. And there's all these files, all these, these dossiers, you know, on them. And what these profiles basically do is they list their secret identities, their strengths, their weaknesses, all this information. So for those of you guys who read like Tower of Babel, where Batman was keeping detailed files on how to defeat the individual members of the Justice League, imagine that information, but expanded to include almost the entirety of the superhero community, or at least the most prominent members, as well as the various organizations that exist out there, Pro Gene Tech, Star Labs, so on and so forth. And so again, because of this, what ends up happening is we actually find out that Cord, uh, one of the, one of the, I guess, warehouses that was owned by Ted Cord had basically been raided. It had stored several hundred pounds of kryptonite. And again, this was a major issue just simply because of the fact that if a person got a hold of this kryptonite, they could use it for any number of reasons on Superboy, Connor Kent, because remember, following the death of Superman, there was, you know, Connor Kent during the reign of the Superman. He was a holdover. He was maintained by DC Comics. He's still around. And he actually has a really badass moment in Infinite Crisis when he fights Superboy Prime. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> I love that fight. But what, uh, what Blue Beetle does is he kind of reaches out to Oracle, says, you know, we need to call everybody in. We need to find out who jacked this kryptonite. So we've got, you know, we've got Dr. Fate. We got Power Girl, Hot Girl, so on and so forth. But again, what this does is highlight the lack of trust between these different members of the Justice League team. And so because of that, a lot of individuals kind of look at Blue Beetle and say, look, we're just kind of doing this as a favor. But honestly, man, there's really nothing to go on here. You're kind of wasting your time. A lot of them don't really take him seriously. And, you know, one by one, slowly but surely, they all sort of begin to bail out. Now, of course, Hal Jordan appears before Blue Beetle and says, hey, look, my ring's picking up some very trace, some very faint signatures of radiation. But what this tells us is that whoever it was that took this kryptonite did so with stealth in mind, that if some of the world's greatest superheroes, Power Girl with all her different abilities, Starfire with all her different abilities, Dr. Fate in the realm of magic, if all these different individuals cannot find any real trace of evidence to indicate who it was that took this kryptonite or where, well then suddenly Blue Beetle begins to lose credibility. He's the boy who cried wolf. But with Hal Jordan on Blue Beetle's side and saying, look, I'm willing to help you, you know, deal with this, it, it kind of bolsters the confidence of Blue Beetle. It makes him feel like he's less of a, of a second stringer and makes him feel like he has more of a place or at least somebody out there is taking him seriously. Now, of course, when the questions asked what happened to this kryptonite and where did it go, Superman makes his appearance. So that's one of the coolest things about this because Blue Beetle looks at this, looks at Superman and says, every time I see him, it's the first time. Every time I see him, no matter when I see him, no matter where I see him, no matter how many times I've seen him before, every time is the first time. His authority, the stance that he has, the fact that he's so large, the confidence that he exudes, you know, it really makes Ted Cord kind of feel insignificant, but the fact that Superman is speaking to him and taking time to talk to him makes him feel important. And so really, it is one of these funny little moments, one of these funny little things in terms of how different people view the concept of the character of Superman. Not only that, Ted Cord actually starts tripping over his words. He starts getting nervous. His mouth dries up. He doesn't really know what to say. Superman says, calm down, relax, tell me what's happening. Now, of course, Blue Beetle explains everything that's going on with regards to the kryptonite that vanished. Superman takes this with the utmost concern and says, look, if there's a hundred pounds of kryptonite running around out there, it's, you know, for Superman and the various kryptonite based individuals out there, it might as well be an atomic bomb. And so it's like that line from the movie Peacemaker. I'm not concerned about the guy who wants 10 nukes. I'm concerned about the guy who only wants one. And so because of this, it's Superman kind of saying, okay, look, this deserves a lot of attention. Now, of course he races off, but then Blue Beetle's sort of accosted by these nonsensical villains and so on and so forth. Now, the funny thing about this, and this is why I love this story so much is because on the surface, it seems woefully unimportant. It seems totally unimportant. And in fact, it's almost over in the blink of an eye in the sense that these guys are basically chased off by Booster Gold who returns to help Blue Beetle. But we'll actually find out later on, this was extremely important. This was a very significant moment in the story. More so than that, again, this basically kind of sets the seeds for Villains United when we find out that Lex Luthor is working alongside uh, Black Adam. He's working alongside Talia Al Ghul. He's working alongside Dr. Psycho, Deathstroke, basically creating this, this new team of supervillains for the purpose of carrying out whatever missions or goals they intend to carry uh, carry out. Again, a lot of this kind of sets the stage for some of the stories that are going to be coming out of this, some of the mini series that lead into Infinite Crisis. But from this point, we jump forward, you know, a little bit, you know, by about a day and a half or so, two and a half days, something like that. And we basically pick up with, you know, Blue Beetle and Booster Gold sort of going through and trying to figure out what's going on. And the reason for this is because of the fact that in Blue Beetle's mind, if someone was contracted to basically rob his, rob his place, you know, rob this 
warehouse, then money had to have changed hands. And if money changed hands, then it could be traceable because in the words of Blue Beetle, people don't just change, exchange money using suitcases anymore. It's all done digitally. Now keep in mind, Blue Beetle is wildly intelligent in terms of what it is that he's capable of, but he also has a great deal of wealth to his name and has a lot of resources at his disposal. The problem is that in the middle of this whole investigation, when Booster Gold steps up to try to, you know, get into this computer and trace these transactions, the whole thing explodes. The whole house is basically totally destroyed. Now, what this does is it sends Blue Beetle on a chase to find out who it was that destroyed this house. And the reason why is because of the fact that this damage also includes Booster Gold receiving third degree burns on 40% of his chest. And so at this point, it's really become personal more so than business related. Now, of course, at this point, the, the investigations of Blue Beetle basically lead him to the Rock of Eternity. Now, the Rock of Eternity, at least as far as I'm aware, the Rock of Eternity is where the wizard Shazam resides. Keep in mind, Shazam is basically the wizard that bestowed Billy Batson with his powers and allowed him to become, you know, Captain Marvel or Shazam or whatever you want to call him. But, you know, this guy, the, the powers that this guy bestowed is the reason why Billy Batson can shout the word Shazam and turn into a superhero. The issue with this is that when it comes to the wizard Shazam, he has a great deal of knowledge on a lot of things that are going on. Keep in mind, this is all still in the era where there's only one singular universe, but a lot of this is kept cloak and dagger. We don't really know what's going on. The Wizard Shazam speaks in a very cryptic way, saying things like there's a lot unfolding at the moment. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. You know, there are a lot of things that are taking place here. You're a man. You're not prepared for what's to come. And then essentially just kind of whisks him away and calls it a day. And that's 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 really it here. And so again, going through these files and, and doing some some investigations, you know, really eight hours until the present day um, in the middle of, of Blue Beetle you know, I guess following his being teleported away, of course, his ship is destroyed. And what it does is it leads to him being taken aboard, taken aboard the Justice League Watchtower. Now, again, this is where he runs into Wonder Woman. And that's the other cool thing about this is because with the character of Wonder Woman, writers tend to write her in a way to where she's either a warrior or she's a woman. She's never both. The great thing about this story is that we kind of get both aspects of her in the sense that she's very calm. She's very welcoming. She has a very warm personality. She's not just like, Blarg, let's go destroy stuff. Like, I mean, she's not really like that in this particular story. And even Blue Beetle in the context of the events comments on that, that whenever Wonder Woman says someone's name, when she speaks to them, it's like she knows everything about your life. And what this is designed to do is kind of build off the work that's been done with Diana Prince to kind of remind us that she is a character who is a warrior in every sense of the word, that she could probably kill Superman if it came down to it. But in the presence of friends, in the presence of people that she's familiar with, she's a friend. She's someone that you can count on, someone you can rely on. And so it's a great way to give us, you know, both sides of who she is in terms of creating a cohesive character for her. The problem with this is that, you know, where she basically says, you know, hey, keep me abreast of your investigation. Let me know what's going on. You know, keep detailed files. It really seems to be more placation than anything else. Like, yeah, sure. I believe you. I mean, I trust you, man. It's okay. Just, you know, keep me aware. Keep me, you know, make sure I'm informed, that kind of thing. But she doesn't really do anything to like go with him and help his investigation. This is compounded by the fact that as Booster Gold is making his way out of the Justice League Watchtower, he comes across Martian Manhunter, John Jones. And John Jones' response is, hey, look, one Wonder Woman said that she may trust you, that she may believe you, but she's really a lot more trusting than she should be. Any superhero with their salt is going to believe that you're just full of crap, that you're just going on about nonsense. And so again, it's not really John Jones trying to be cruel. It's not him trying to be rude. It's him just kind of running over the fact of the situation. Because again, Martian Manhunter is very kind of like, hey, here's how things are. Like, I don't have time to worry about your feelings. Here is the fact of the situation. And that's really the naked truth. The naked truth here is that a majority of the superheroes out there do not consider Blue Beetle to be any one of any real serious note. And what this is designed to do is kind of reflect the existing DC community, right? If I go out into a street and I show people a picture of Batman, I'm going to say, who is that? They're going to say, well, that's Batman. If I show them a picture of Superman, they'll say that's Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, so on and so forth. If I show them a picture of Blue Beetle, they're not going to have a clue who that is. I don't know. Is that blue guy? I have no idea who that is. You know, they're not going to know who he is. The fact that he's obscure to really the, the public at large, the non-comic book reading community at large is a reflection of how he's viewed by the superhero community. The superhero community doesn't take him seriously. He's a small time guy. He's a second stringer. You call Blue Beetle in when everybody else is dead, when there's no one left to fight. You just bring him off the bench and say, hey man, you got to get in there and you got to put up the good fight. You know, people, the general public view him the exact same way. Now, Blue Beetle fans will hit the roof if you tell them that Blue Beetle sucks. <laughs> Walk up to a Blue Beetle fan and say, hey, I was reading about Blue Beetle recently and I got to say, man, that guy sucks. They will freak. <laughs> they will lose their absolute mind. Like he's got a small 
fan base. I think Amazing Zero, we were talking about this in the Discord. He was like, Blue Beetle has a small fan base, but it is a hardcore dedicated fan base. <laughs> it is it is insane. But, you know, as he's kind of going through, you know, back where his home used to be and he's kind of going through this, this, whole, uh, this whole issue, kind of struggling and, and trying to figure out his place and, you know, really asking the question, am I really just going on a wild goose chase? Am I just a dog chasing its tail? He then begins to realize that somebody's watching him. And the reason why is because, you know, he basically discovered what amounts to a small little camera or a small little monitoring device inside the goggles of his helmet. And so what he does is he races off to Booster Gold, tells him what's going on. You know, Booster Gold tries to help, of course, with him sustaining injury. He can't really go. But Booster Gold basically collapses from his injuries, from the pain he's experiencing. He's put back to sleep by the nurses. And then Blue Beetle tells the nurse, he says, hey, look, you have to promise me something. Tell Booster Gold, no matter what happens, it's not his fault. That he's the best friend that Blue Beetle has ever had. And so this basically leads into the ending of the story. And it picks up with Blue Beetle following, or I guess, arriving at Checkmate, which really kind of brings us back to the beginning of the story. Now, with regards to him going through this database and going through all this information, what happens is we end up finding out the hidden hand behind all these things that have been happening is Maxwell Lord. And what ended up happening is that when Batman created Brother Eye, it was designed really with like the best intentions, or at least the best intentions in terms of like Batman, right? I mean, Batman's not like, Batman's not like a, like an altruistic guy. Batman's like, Batman's not like, hey, look, I really care about your thoughts and feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Batman's pretty far from that. But what ended up happening here is that the Checkmate organization, which was previously kind of a, a branch off of the US government, where it operated on behalf of the US government and carrying out or really kind of serving as like a monitoring arm, was relaunched and retooled by Maxwell Lord for the purpose of hijacking Brother Eye and using Brother Eye as a means to monitor superheroes around the world. And so what Maxwell Lord wanted to do is basically say, hey, look, there's like nine, you know, with of all the superhero, I guess all the super powered people out there, you know, the 1.9 million people out there who have powers, 95% of them are nuisance powers, meaning that, you know, they can barely use their telekinesis or they can kind of read surface thoughts or maybe they can teleport a little bit or something like that. They can't do anything outrageous, but there's the 5% that can do insane things, who can fly, who are invulnerable, who have super strength, super speed, you know, who are a credible threat to any country they come across, not just a group of people, but a country. And Maxwell Lord's idea is to basically say, we're not going to allow our world to be ran by people with superpowers we're going to allow our world to be ran by humans and we're going to control superheroes. Now, this is not Maxwell Lord doing this for the purpose of just saying, we really need a great safe world where superheroes are under control. This is a power hungry Maxwell Lord. He's looking to use Checkmate or really you know, use Brother Eye and Project OMAC as a way to basically control the world. I mean, that's really what this is. This is kind of world domination. If you control Superman, if you control Wonder Woman, if you control the Green Lantern, the Flash, Aquaman, so on and so forth, you control the future of the planet because all you have to do is send the Justice League into a country and that country doesn't exist anymore. And so because of that, Maxwell Lord basically gives Blue Beetle a choice. He says, look, you can join me in this crusade. You can join me in this task or you can stand against me. If you stand against me, you are going to die. Now, what he also does is he basically uh, deploys one of his OMAX, these super powerful beings. that are designed to really kind of counter the various powers of different individuals out there. For those of you guys who are familiar, and I don't know very many people who are, but for those of you guys who are familiar with like the old school Marvel UK Captain Britain stuff, think of this as like, a kind of DC version of the Fury. I mean, it's not intrinsic in the sense that like the Fury was designed to counter every single superpower, but you guys understand what I'm saying in the sense that it was kind of like, you know, this, this, force of, of some kind. But the fact remains here that because of the fact that Blue Beetle chooses not to ally himself with Maxwell Lord, Maxwell Lord shoots him in the head, just kills Blue Beetle on the spot. And that's the death of Ted Kord. Now, what this does is it sets the stage for later on down the line, which leads into the events of Infinite Crisis. The reason being is because the world is becoming a darker place. Now, on the surface, it does not seem like this has anything to do with Infinite Crisis. And I understand that in its entirety. However, the darker nature of these stories, because you'll notice these stories are dark. These stories are gritty. These stories are not designed to be happy and fluffy. They're in stark contrast to what you're seeing in DC Rebirth right now. The nature of the superhero community in the world at this moment in DC Comics with regards to this countdown to Infinite Crisis is the reason why Superboy Prime, why it is that Earth 3 Lex Luthor and Earth 2 Superman and Lois Lane show up in the world in the first place. is because to them, the world's darker. These are not superheroes. These are people who used to be superheroes, but they're basically villains now. There's no real difference between villains and heroes. 
Okay, so as we get into Infinite Crisis, or really not Infinite Crisis official, as we, we sort of get into it, I'm gonna go ahead and roll this in as part of Infinite Crisis. We're just gonna sort of title it this way. Remember, we're covering Infinite Crisis because of the fact that this really gives us Superboy Prime, and it lays the groundwork for what happens with regards to like the Jeff Johns Green Lantern uh, line of stories going into like Sinestro Core War and all that kind of good stuff. Plus, it's just a story that I've really felt like doing, but I figure if I'm gonna do Infinite Crisis, like we're gonna, we're gonna go for broke. We're gonna do it all. <laughs> we're really gonna to swing for the fences here and we pick up with what's called the OMAC project. Now, the OMAC project is essentially explained to us over the course of this particular story, but what we end up doing here is we actually pick up with a girl named Sasha Bordeaux. Now, Sasha was one of these characters who's relatively new, or I guess really who is new relative to the creation of this story. So she appeared in Detective Comics 751, I think it was in 2000, and she was one of those characters that DC brought in and then just didn't really know what to do with her. I mean, it was one of those weird situations because at the time, DC was toying with the notion of like Batman having a love interest and that's kind of been an on again off again thing it's always been the idea that maybe Bruce Wayne will find love and he won't be so mean and brooding and so on and so forth but people love the, the mean and brooding Batman they love that version of his character and so because of that uh, Sasha was shuffled out pretty fast in the in the sense that she was basically kind of rolled over into Checkmate now at the time Checkmate was essentially a governmental organization that was similar but a little bit different from Marvel's Hellfire Club in the sense that where Marvel's Hellfire Club exists behind the scenes to more or less try to influence and take over the world, Checkmate does not serve that purpose, but they are similar in the sense that their ranks are, are modeled after chess pieces, black kings, black queens, white kings, white queens, so on and so forth. Now, of course, with much like, uh, really much like the Hellfire Club, the Black King is like the top person in uh, in Checkmate. And of course, right now in this story, the Black King is uh, is Maxwell Lord. But this story takes place immediately after the death of, uh, of Blue Beetle. And so Sasha, alongside a handful of others, are basically tasked with taking Blue Beetle away. Now, because of the fact that Sasha had spent some time alongside Bruce Wayne, because she had basically been his bodyguard, because she had been the one to deduce his identity after basically, you know, poking around and, and noticing how often Bruce Wayne was staying out late at night and suddenly putting two and two together, the idea eventually came to her that as part of Checkmate, uh, she wasn't really rank and file, which is to say she didn't believe wholeheartedly in their ideals. But there was a measure of loyalty in the sense that her life was basically on the verge of being lost and Checkmate brought her back from the brink of death. And so because of that, she had loyalty to the organization, but under the direction of Maxwell Lord, Checkmate had become a far more sinister organization. Now, the other half of this is that Maxwell Lord had basically come into control of something called Brother, really it was like Brother Brother Mark One. Uh, we're going to refer to it as Brother One for the time being, but the fact remains that Maxwell Lord had come into control of this. And what ends up happening here is Maxwell Lord basically just begins using Brother One for the purpose of monitoring all the superheroes across the world, specifically monitoring the members of the Justice League. Now, the reason why this happened was because of the fact that Maxwell Lord, you know, killing Ted Cord, came to the realization that if Ted knew about, about Maxwell Lord, what he was getting up to, what he was doing, then it also meant that somebody else would eventually figure out what was going on. Now, the other half of this is that Ted Kord, the Blue Beetle, had basically eradicated almost all of the files that Brother One had on the different metahumans that existed, because remember, Maxwell Lord wanted to keep an eye on metahumans and basically keep them under his control. Now, when Ted Kord destroyed those files, the only ones that were left behind were the OMAC Project files, and so because of that, it still leaves the OMAC Project intact, and we'll find out more about that as we get towards the end of this story, but really, this is just a matter of him, of Maxwell Lord keeping an eye on the members of the Justice League, as well as other people who have associated with uh, with Blue Beetle, whether they were friends or enemies, regardless of their stance. Now, what this also does is it coincides with Batman trying to figure out what's going on with Brother One due to the fact that he doesn't have control of it anymore. Remember, Batman made Brother One for the purpose of keeping an eye on metahumans after the events of, uh, really, the events of Identity Crisis. So because of the fact that Batman came to the belief that metahumans couldn't be trusted, that they had to be monitored, Brother One served the purpose of just keeping an eye on them. The problem is that with Maxwell Lord taking over Brother One, what he's done is basically removed Brother One away from Bruce Wayne and now has total control over it. And so because of that, things progress exactly the way we would expect them to, but it also picks up with Wonder Woman and Booster Gold. Now keep in mind, Booster Gold and Ted Kord were extremely close friends. And of all the people who were on Ted Kord's side, you know, Booster Gold was really the only one that generally, that, that genuinely actually believed him. Now, of course, Wonder Woman believed him to a degree, but what this does is it shows us the fallout of what happens when a member of the Justice League dies because no one else believed them. Something else to also point out here is that Blue Beetle himself was not really a part of the Justice League per se. He was part of Justice League International, which was kind of like a branch off team. And we'll actually see that group reform to a degree, not nearly as big as it was before, but to a degree with regards to them calling in their own group of people in response to the uh, to the 
death of Blue Beetle. And so what ends up happening here is we pick up with uh, with Sasha when she's basically sent on a mission by Maxwell Lord. But what she does is she takes the goggles of Blue Beetle and she mails them to Bruce Wayne. Now, of course, the crazy thing about this is that when, when Alfred comes downstairs and initially goes to give Batman the package, he kind of blows it off because in his mind, the biggest concern is what is he going to do when the world finds out that he no longer has control of a massive orbital satellite system designed to, to monitor metahumans? What's going to happen when the Justice League realizes that he doesn't control that anymore? More so than that, what happens if the person who does control it decides to use it for nefarious purposes? And so because of this, he's basically just kind of hounded by Alfred and eventually opens up the box only to realize that it came from Sasha. And when Sasha basically says, you don't control Brother I anymore, it's also met with the goggles of Blue Beetle, which is Batman basically learning that Blue Beetle has been killed. And so what happens is, of course, the most likely scenario, the most likely fallout when Batman goes to visit the rest of the Justice League and tells them what's going on. Now, of course, Booster Gold freaks out. And the reason why is because Booster Gold says, look, this is your fault. Blue Beetle came to you and said, there's something going on here. Somebody's doing something behind the scenes. I'm trying to figure out who broke into my warehouse. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with all this. Batman had a general idea of what was going on, but didn't say anything. He didn't speak up. And so in the eyes of, of Booster Gold, Batman's refusal to act resulted in Blue Beetle's death. Whereas if Batman had told Blue Beetle, look, here's what I think is going on. Let's just go ahead and put our minds together. Let's put two and two together, you know, combine our resources and see what we can come to, which would have likely resulted in the rest of the Justice League getting involved and would have seen the survival of Blue Beetle. Instead, Batman's refusal to help resulted in the death of Blue Beetle. Now, the other half of this is the rest of the Justice League. Wonder Woman was more or less patronizing when Blue Beetle went to go see her. When he said, hey, look, here's what I think is going on. She said, well, that's nice. Come and see me when you have some more information. She said it in the nicest way possible, but she more or less blew him off. Martian Manhunter, the exact same way. Superman, the exact same way. Hal Jordan, all the other superheroes blew off Ted Kord and assumed that he, he was basically going on a wild goose chase. Of course, he was onto something. It resulted in his death. And so they're all experiencing their own measure of guilt. But the other half of this is that we're also starting to see infighting among the Justice League, more so than we were before. The Justice League has always kind of bickered. It's always, they've always argued to a degree. And that whole, you know, dichotomy between the different belief systems of all the different characters is what makes the Justice League so interesting because Wonder Woman's a warrior, Superman is the moral backbone, Batman is the detective. Everybody has something different to offer to the team, but they all come to the Justice League with their own experiences guiding the way they view the world. And so because of that, they bump heads. They don't necessarily see eye to eye 100% of the time. There was a time when they did, but that was 1960s DC Comics. Now it's more realistic. It's more grounded. And that is a theme that I want you to keep in the back of your head as we end up going more into Infinite Crisis, because what we're going to find out is the return of Superboy Prime, the return of Earth 2 Superman, the return of Earth 3 Alexander Luther. It's not altruism. They look at the modern day superheroes and say, you've fallen from grace. You are not who you're supposed to be. And it's really going to be a Jeff Johns meta commentary on the state of DC Comics at the time that this story was written, when he was basically using Infinite Crisis to say, superheroes should be stories that are uplifting, stories that are cheerful, stories that give people a reason to look to the sunrise, not stories that are dark and are brooding and make everybody feel miserable about their lives. They should be a welcome escape, not something people feel like they kind of have to read and darkness that ends up following their path. But regarding the story, you know, regarding the events that are going on right here with the OMAC project, with Sasha coming to the realization that Maxwell Lord knows that, you know, Batman had gotten a hold of these goggles, her idea is that it's only a matter of time before Maxwell Lord traces it back to her. And when that happens, the question becomes, what goes on next? Now, what this also does is it basically coincides with Maxwell Lord having a woman by the name of Jessica Midnight execute the other members of the Checkmate organization. Now, this is a twofold step by Maxwell Lord. The first is to basically impose his will on those around him to solidify the fact that he's not someone to be trifled with. The second is to consolidate power unto himself. And that's one of the reasons why Maxwell Lord was so interesting is because when you look at him, there were a lot of allegories to like, you know, Hitler, for example, you know, the Knight of the Long Knives executing the head of the uh, of the brown brown shirts, brown coats, whatever they were, you know, executing all those guys and then consolidating power under the Nazi party. At the same time, Maxwell Lord does something similar. Now, it's not to say that Maxwell Lord and Hitler are the same thing. What Hitler did is something that's been seen time and time again by ruling people. It's, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for someone to go in to have allies in order to help themselves, you know, take some measure of power and then kill their allies and usurp their territory. That's not an uncommon thing. That's happened all throughout history. And what DC does with Maxwell Lord is they take that exact same concept and roll it in here. Now, of course, the way that Maxwell Lord does this is by virtue of his ability to dominate the minds of others. Now, Maxwell's ability to manipulate minds is not like wholesale telepathy, right? It's not him just going in and just saying like, I have total control of your mind. 
on. It's really more akin to like what the Purple Man does in the sense that where the Purple Man puts off pheromones and basically issues commands and people just can't resist it, Maxwell Lord is much the same way, but it's really a lot of mental control that goes in there. The issue with this is that Maxwell Lord's ability to dominate minds is contingent based on the mindset of the person that he's dominating at the time. So a fully powered Superman, 100% cognizant of his surroundings, focusing only on Maxwell Lord would not be as easy to dominate as the Superman that we'll see in this story when he is dominated by Maxwell Lord because his focus is kind of in different places at the same time and he's in a relatively weakened state in terms of where his mind's at. But the fact remains here that under the control of Maxwell Lord, Jessica Midnight kills all these different heads of the houses. At the same time, Maxwell Lord says, now we're going to frame her for this crime. And this is how Maxwell functions. That's why he's such a great charismatic guy. That's why a lot of people love his character is because he's just so cruel, man. Like he's just so mean. The Big Lebowski, <laughs> he's just mean, man. Like it's 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 crazy how, how it all comes down. But the fact remains here that this is really, again, Sasha's loyalty is being tested to the sense that she doesn't believe that she can be someone that can truly ally herself with Maxwell Lord or his ideologies. And so what ends up happening here is she basically calls a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Bruce Wayne. But what happens is the entire scenario is seen by Maxwell Lord. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that by virtue of her act, manipulate Maxwell Lord to, to make him believe what she wants to believe, just by virtue of engineering circumstances in her favor, Maxwell Lord had no reason to believe that Sasha Bordeaux was against him. But with this revelation, he now knows that she is. And so what happens is we start seeing the implementation of these OMAX. Now, the OMAX, and I wanted to kind of wait until we got to this section to, to basically run over this. The OMAX are basically cyborgs, but they're inherently human. And what happened is that somewhere along the line, basically individuals started having nanomachines planted inside their bodies without them knowing it. And so what would happen is under the direction of Maxwell Lord by activating, you know, the OMAC protocol, uh, these individuals, their nanomachines would effectively manifest. They would take on a cyborg form and then they would just operate according to whatever it is that Maxwell Lord tells them to do through the Brother One system. And so because that, you know, when these individuals become OMAX, they have no self-will. They have no free will, no self-determination. They simply do as they're told. And so what happens is, of course, you know, Sasha is basically taken by Maxwell Lord and then Batman fends off as best he can. But of course, against these OMAX, Batman can only do so much. And so, of course, he's rescued by Superman. And that's really that. But at this point, it's basically everybody kind of rallying around this idea that Blue Beetle had died and how they're reacting to it, specifically with the return of Guy Gardner. Now, remember, because of the fact that Booster Gold and Blue Beetle, along with a handful of the other minor superheroes, all served on Justice League International, they basically formed a kind of brotherhood of sorts in the sense that whenever one of them is in danger, they will all respond if at all possible. And so because of this, with the death of Blue Beetle, Guy Gardner's response alongside Booster Gold is, we have to go find out who it was that killed them. More so than that, they actually tell Wonder Woman to stay out of it. And the reason why is because in their mind, they're like, you're part of that Justice League, you're not part of our Justice League. Now, this is a in-comic kind of allegory for the way that fans viewed the Justice League at one point in time. And the reason why is because remember, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, there was no traditional Justice League. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Lantern, so on and so forth. There was Justice League International. It wasn't until 1998, some 13 years after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, that we got the return of the Justice League as we knew them. But the idea here was that the members of Justice League uh, International were basically their own group. And so because of that, there were essentially two two factions of the Justice League running around, even if one of them wasn't official. And so what it did is it basically kind of created a rift in the sense that they didn't really see themselves eye to eye. They didn't really see themselves as equal. It was really like, that's your team. This is my team. You stay away. I stay away and everything will be okay. Now, again, they worked together in times of extreme duress, but on the whole, they really saw themselves as their own individual teams. And so because of this, you know, this is really just the revelation, you know, kind of coming to fruition, the revelation continuing that everybody is essentially going after whoever it was that was behind the murder of Blue Beetle. Of course, we know that to be Maxwell Lord. The other problem with this is that with Maxwell Lord using uh, using Brother One to spy on the Justice League inside the Watchtower, he comes to the realization that Batman is, is effectively spilling the beans on everything he knows behind the events of Brother One and the whole nine yards. And so because of this, Maxwell Lord essentially jumps the gun and says, if I can't take out Batman here, then I will take over someone who can take out Batman. And this is when he basically begins to use his ability to take over the 
the mind of Superman. And that's why I say, if it were Superman in the height of combat, strictly focusing on Maxwell Lord, Maxwell Lord probably would not be able to dominate his mind. With Superman operating as Clark Kent with his guard effectively down, Maxwell Lord is able to overtake him. Now, the problem with this little bit of a story here is that I wasn't able to find, or I wasn't able to get my hands on the comic where Superman is operating under the control of Maxwell Lord. I actually wasn't able to get my hands on that. I, so we kind of have to jump to like Wonder Woman number 219. But all that really happened in that story was that Superman had basically gone after Batman and tried to kill him under the control of Maxwell Lord, but Wonder Woman intervened. And so because of that, we basically pick up with Wonder Woman as part of this equation. Now, of course, Wonder Woman fighting, uh, fighting against Superman is actually a pretty cool battle. And the reason why is because it's again, DC sort of reiterating this idea that when it really comes down to it, Wonder Woman is every bit Superman's equal, if not a little more superior. And the reason why is because of the fact that Wonder Woman is a warrior, whereas Superman is more of a protector. And so because of that, their ideologies, their moral compasses really fly in the face of what we would consider to be an actual battle between the two in terms of who would actually win. Now, one thing to also keep in mind is that Superman is fighting with the extent of his powers here. And that's why I say this battle is so interesting is because right now in this moment, Superman's not holding back. This is a fight presumably to the death. Now, Wonder Woman tries to keep him as live as best she can, just because of the fact that she's aware that Superman is not in control of his full faculties. But the fact remains here, that when it comes to a legit fight between the two of them, they're both able to hold their own against one another, and Wonder Woman proves herself to be really formidable against him. And so I think it was kind of a cool thing that should be mentioned here, just because of the fact that when we talk about superheroes, the Wonder Woman is really like the first woman of comics, the first lady of comics in superhero form. I and mean, when we're talking about just like, you know, the quintessential women in comics, that title goes to Lois Lane in my book. But in terms of, you know, powerful women in major roles, Wonder Woman's really at the cream of the crop when it comes to that. And so because of this, you know, with Superman, more or less subdued, at least temporarily, Wonder Woman wraps Maxwell Lord around with a lasso of truth and says, tell me how to relinquish Superman from your control. Maxwell Lord responds by simply saying, kill me. And that's exactly what Wonder Woman does. She snaps his neck. So for those of you guys who have seen that now famous panel where Wonder Woman kills Maxwell Lord, you've probably seen it in like the most insane, you know, comic book deaths of all time or something like that, or like the craziest Wonder Woman moments. You usually see those kind of clickbait, nonsensical things on Buzzfeed. But if you've seen those, you know, in in, in anticipation of the Wonder Woman movie, this is where that comes from. This is why that happens because Maxwell Lord literally says, once I take control of a person, they're not free unless I want them to be free or unless I die. Now, this is really where the rift in the Justice League comes into play. The reason why I say that is because within the Justice League themselves, you know, even within, you know, like Superman's mantra, killing is a no-no. The only time it's okay to kill is if there's absolutely no other choice. Now, in the eyes of Wonder Woman, there was no other choice. It was the only way to free Superman from Maxwell Lord's control, but that's not necessarily true. Wonder Woman could have knocked him out. Wonder Woman could have, you know, knocked out both Superman and Maxwell Lord, taking them back to the Watchtower or taking them back to Earth, and then turn around and said, okay, look, you know, we have to find some way to reverse this. There were different roads that could have been taken according to Superman, but in Wonder Woman's mind, that was not the case. She was thinking in the moment. Not only that, it was also a little bit of revenge. She looked at this and said, this is the man that killed Blue Beetle. Now, I would go as far as to say that Wonder Woman was making up for what she perceived to be her failure as a superhero. In the moment of truth, when Blue Beetle came to her and said, I need your help, she wasn't there to help him. And so in a lot of ways, I would consider this to be a scenario that plays out where she basically says, hey, look, you know, this seems to be me just kind of helping him out, making amends for the fact that I wasn't there when he needed me, basically getting vengeance. The problem with this is that with the death of Maxwell Lord, the King is Dead program is activated and Brother One basically transforms himself into Brother I and becomes fully autonomous. Now, we don't initially know this is the case. And in fact, as the reader, the only thing that we have to believe is that there was some kind of fail-safe program that was activated that for whatever reason or in some form or fashion, that Brother One was basically monitoring the vital signs of, uh, of Maxwell Lord. And with Maxwell Lord dying, that the program was then activated. But in fact, we're actually going to learn that's not the case. But switching back over to Sasha Bordeaux and Jessica Midnight, because of the fact that Jessica Midnight was being held prisoner after being framed by Maxwell Lord or really being forced by Maxwell Lord to kill those members of Checkmate, as well as Sasha Bordeaux, who was caught red-handed leaking information to Batman, the two of them basically engineer their escape. And this is when DC begins the process of sort of offering some new standing for the character of Sasha Bordeaux. And the reason why is because she begins to show indications that she herself is an OMAC. Remember, when a person becomes 
becomes an OMAC, they don't know they've been infected with those those nanobots. You know, they're they're basically lose all sense of individuality and they effectively black out. I mean, it's almost like just chunks of their memory are gone, you know, and then maybe they go back to being their normal selves. Maybe they never go back and they stay OMAX forever. But the fact remains here that with Batman recovering from his injuries after sustaining a pretty heavy beating from Superman, what ends up happening here is he begins talking with Brother One. And what Brother One says, or I guess Brother I now, uh, what he basically says is that it was created by Batman for the purpose of monitoring superhumans and to basically catalog information. But under the control of Maxwell Lord, the programming of Brother uh, Brother I was modified to basically view superhumans as an inherent threat to Earth, but to operate under the direction of Maxwell Lord. With Maxwell Lord having been killed, Brother I did the next best thing, the only thing it really knew how to do. It made itself fully autonomous. It merged the programming of Bruce Wayne and Maxwell Lord together and basically said, I now exist for the purpose of tracking all metahumans on Earth and then killing them all. And so what this does is it basically sets in motion this massive release, this massive activation of all these OMAX across the world. So for those of you guys who jumped directly into Infinite Crisis and those of you guys who are curious as to why you see all these giant robots flying around and attacking everybody, this is the reason why. Because Brother I basically activated the OMAC protocol and what it did is it sent all these, it really, you know, activated all these different OMAX. Now, in terms of how many there actually are, we're not given that information right off the bat. Instead, we actually end up having, you know, the death of a few superheroes here and there, Rocket Red 7. Now, when it comes to the Rocket Reds, they were created for the purpose of being the USSR's own superhero team, you know, strictly for their, for their own country. The issue with this is that with the OMAX being activated, superhero groups from across the world who would normally never interact are now banding together. But the other reason for this is because of the fact that Rocket Red has a lot of dealings with conventional superheroes as we know them operating out of uh, out of the United States. And so because of this, you know, Rocket Red basically tells Guy Gardner, put one of your shields around me. Rocket Red then activates his ability to create, you know, all kinds of, uh, of energy projections and basically blows up the entire area inside this bubble, killing himself as well as these different, uh, different OMAX. But at this point, this is when we basically learned Sasha Bordeaux herself is an OMAC. The reason why we learned this is because of the fact that her body is undergoing the physical change when the nanomachines activate. But the difference is that she's not like all the other OMAX. She maintains her own individuality. Now, the reason why she maintains her individuality is because she was not subjected to the same process that all the other OMAX were subjected to when they were given their nanobots. Instead, she was a unique creation really created by Maxwell Lord himself. And the reason why was because Maxwell Lord wanted a fail safe. Maxwell Lord wanted to know that if things went awry, that he would basically have somebody who was loyal to him with absolute certainty and would have all the powers of an OMAC. But of course, with Maxwell Lord being dead and Sasha Bordeaux having turned against him anyway, once her nanobots begin to activate, she basically has all the powers of an OMAC, but she's self-aware. She's not tied into the control of Brother I, so she's not forced to do the bidding of others. Now, at this point, this is when she contacts Bruce Wayne and says, look, you have to round up all the superheroes as best you can. We have to find a way to basically fight off or, or basically destroy Brother I. And when Batman's response is why, she basically says, because Brother I is activating them. Now, when Batman asks them, what are you talking about? She says, the OMAX, that there's around 1.3 million of them. And so because of that, there's 1 million some odd OMAX running around the planet Earth, and they've all been tasked with the purpose of killing metahumans. It's really just things popping off in the extreme degree. And so what ends up happening here is Batman really kind of makes this last ditch effort. That's one of the reasons why this is kind of cool. And one of the reasons why we really had to do a countdown to, to Infinite Crisis. The reason why is because of the fact that in that story, we had seen that somebody had broken into the warehouse of Blue Beetle. Somebody had stolen, you know, a ton of kryptonite, but we never found out where the kryptonite went. This is when Batman starts putting two and two together. And this is why this is such kind of a, you know, really a tragic moment in the story because Batman figured out what was happening right off the bat. As soon as he was in the warehouse and he started looking around, he immediately figured out what was going on. If he had put his mind to task when this all first started, Blue Beetle would have been alive. But what Batman says is that within this particular warehouse was basically a giant EMP machine that Blue Beetle had made that would set off an EMP in a pretty large location. Now, of course, the only way to really take out every single OMAC across the world is to detonate an EMP that's equivalent to a 50 megaton nuclear bomb. Well, the issue is that it would kill everybody in range. I mean, it would literally just kind of blink out the electrical impulses in their brains. Everybody would just die. And so because of that, the idea is to basically confine all these different OMAX into a singular location using a massive a massive number of superheroes as a beacon, as bait. And so Batman basically draws on Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart and says, grab as many heroes as you can, go to this mountain out in the middle of nowhere, and then draw the OMAX to you. When that happens, we're going to activate this EMP and we're going to try to take them all out. The problem with this is that Batman is actually too little too late. Now, none of those heroes die. Instead, it all 
really comes down to Sasha. And what ends up happening is that with, with all these Omax basically just bearing down on them, descending on all these different superheroes, that what ends up happening is Sasha actually hacks into Brother Eye directly. And what she does is she distributes a virus that basically begins to shut down the connection between the nanobots in the in the uh, Omax and Brother Eye itself. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that all the Omax are destroyed. And in fact, some 200,000 managed to continue existing. But the big drop in this story, the, the huge revelation that really came out of the OMAC project was that with the conclusion of this, we end up finding out that Brother Eye had actually taken the footage of Wonder Woman killing Maxwell Lord and broadcast it out to the world. And that is the huge event that comes out of this. That's why the story is important for Infinite Crisis, and that's why it creates a rift in the superhero community, because of the fact that the world now sees Wonder Woman committing murder. Okay. Man, we are here, man. Let, man. let me tell you something, Rob Core, man. Let me tell you something now. And for the crisis. Superboy Prime, man. Man, let me tell you. <laughs> when Superboy Prime fights everyone, dude, it is. <laughs> dude, that's why I titled this Superboy Prime versus everyone, because that's exactly what it is. And he wrecks everyone. It's the coolest thing. It's like the coolest thing ever. I understand. Is this what I've been missing? Is this what I've been missing with DC Comics? Like, let's get into this. All right, because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting hyped up as it is. All right, before we start this, what I want to do is I want to flesh out the multiversal concept in the realm of DC Comics. So, so here's the deal. All right, those of you guys who are familiar with this, bear with me for a second, but even now it still kind of baffles people a little bit. All right, in the history of DC Comics, there's been two multiverses. I mean, Grant Morrison does his own thing, but we're going to leave Grant Morrison out of this equation. There's been two different iterations of the multiverse. The first one is the one that was destroyed with Crisis on Infinite Earths. The second one is the one that comes back because of this story, Infinite Crisis. So this actually makes a new multiverse, new histories, different things like that. But the fact remains here that we don't need to go into a great big, huge explanation about Crisis on Infinite Earths. We know about that story. I've done a video on it. We have the origin of Superboy Prime that kind of helps us to tie into it a little bit. But what ended up happening here is that essentially the multiverse collapsed. So it was the end of all things with regards to the DC universe. And what came after that was one singular universe. So everything that happened in DC comics between the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths uh, in 1985 and right now in the beginning of this story has all taken place in one singular universe called New Earth. That's where that whole phrase comes from. Now, with regards to the characters that we're going to see here, Superboy Prime, Earth 2 Superman, Earth 2 Lois Lane, Earth 3 uh, Alexander Luther, we don't really have to worry about like Earth 3 and different things like that. All we have to know is that during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths when the multiverse was collapsing, uh, because of the fact that all these different universes were impacted, the superheroes just ran around grabbing who they could, when they could, and then brought them into the fold to fight against the Anti-Monitor. The result was that because DC wanted to basically revamp the Superman mythos and return Superman to being the sole survivor of Krypton with no other versions of himself out there, what they did is they said, okay, at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths, Superman from Earth 2, which is basically the 1930s, 1940s Superman, uh, Lois Lane from Earth 2, from that same point in time, 1930s, 1940s, and Alexander Luther, who's basically the son of Lex Luthor from Earth 3, who was a good guy, uh, they're going to be shunted off to the Paradise dimension. Now, DC's intention with Crisis on Infinite Earths was to never use them again. It was to basically write them out of the story, and the Paradise Dimension was effectively heaven. That's really what it was. It was their own little realm, their own little place. It was heaven, and they were never going to be seen or heard from again. Now, cue the post-crisis landscape. Because of stories like the death of Gwen Stacy in 1971, comic books were moving towards this trend of becoming darker. In the 1980s, I think it was 1986 or 1987, something like that, uh, we ended up getting Batman uh, The Dark Knight Returns. We got Batman The killing joke and between those stories comic books began to become darker and more realistic and more of a reflection of the cynical nature of the real world now with regards to this story what jeff johns is doing is basically issuing a meta commentary but there are a handful of things that led up to this because it wasn't like infinite crisis just dropped out of nowhere like there were things that were going on that were leading up to this in uh jla justice league of america number 118 119 and 120 what ended up happening is the Justice League was going against various forces that seemed to just kind of be there. They were just, you know, random individuals for the Justice League to fight. But in the middle of all that, Martian Manhunter was just suddenly kidnapped and uh, the entire Justice League Watchtower was completely obliterated. Now, what we also have is the OMAC project. That's sort of where we talked about Batman's whole OMAC thing and all those different robots and so on and so forth that were just kind of activating throughout the world with the intention of annihilating metahumans. All these things began to converge into the start of Infinite Crisis. Now, there's a 
handful of other things too, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. We're gonna go ahead and jump directly into this. So of course, this comes as fallout of the destruction of the Justice League Watchtower, but also the revelation from the rest of the Justice League that Batman had created the OMAC project. And because of that, the OMAC project was basically hijacked by Maxwell Lord, its entire purpose was corrupted, and it became an evil entity. And so the result is that trust in the Justice League is almost completely obliterated. Keep in mind, we also saw Wonder Woman kill Maxwell Lord. And so because of that, because of the fact that Maxwell Lord was killed, uh, what this does, or at least what this did, is it resulted in the entire superhero community and the world basically going at odds with one another. Humanity looked at superheroes as dangerous people now. Superheroes, the Justice League, couldn't trust each other. And so because of this, what it does is it switches over to Connor Kent. Now, Connor Kent, as he exists here, uh, as, he exists, as he exists here, there we go, Connell, uh, he's a holdover from the death of Superman. And remember, when Superman died in 1992, 1993, DC released four new versions of him. There was the Eradicator, there was Cyborg, there was basically the Metropolis Kid, and then there was John Henry Irons, also known as Steel, who just had a giant Steel Superman suit. He didn't actually have any powers or anything. But once Superman came back, DC didn't really know what to do with these different versions of the character. So some went away, some just kind of vanished, never to be seen or heard from again. But Connor Kent was one of the most popular. And so what ended up happening is DC just started shunting him off to like team books, you know, Young Justice and, you know, Titans, Teen Titans, that kind of thing. And because of that, uh, his character still maintained, you know, face value, still maintained publication in the realm of DC and relevance in the eyes of fans. It was just the idea of him going back to the way he was in the 1990s was effectively gone. Now, the other half of this equation is that Connor Kent has basically walked away from being a superhero. And the reason why is because there came a point when he was essentially taken over by Lex Luthor and the result was that he was basically forced to fight his teammates. And so once he had regained his mind and he had come back to his normal self, he essentially walked away. Now, the reason why this is significant is because of the fact that Connor Kent is being watched by several individuals that we can't see who are also watching a multitude of events unfold all across the face of the earth. And because of all these different conflicts, because of all these different skirmishes, because Connor Kent does not want to be Superboy or is not going to act as Superboy because of the fact that Batman's OMAC project has basically run amok, what this has done is it has led these individuals to believe that these people, these superheroes on Earth are not superheroes. They're not acting the way superheroes should. And so because of that, in their mind, something needs to be corrected. Something basically needs to happen to fix this problem. Now, at this point, we switch over to the Spectre. Now, this is small, but this is something that I actually wanted to toss in here just for the sake of showing you guys how much lead up, you know, how big the whole Infinite Crisis thing was. If you guys remember our video where we talked about Green Lantern Rebirth and the idea that Hal Jordan had basically left his role as the Spectre or was really freed from his role as the Spectre and went back to being Hal Jordan as we knew him, an Air Force pilot or really a, a test pilot eventually going back into the Green Lantern Corps again, what this did is it left the Spectre without a host. Now, with the Spectre not having a host, it was already on the verge of insanity and began to sort of dip over. And so because of this, the Spectre was manipulated by a being called Eclipso, which is basically like the representation of God's wrath in the DC Universe. But what it did is it sent the Spectre on this absolute rampage, the reason being because the Spectre operates as the, you know, the, the extension of God's judgment. You know, it operates as, as God's judgment in the realm of DC Comics. And so because of this, Eclipso would basically approach the Spectre and said, hey, look, everything exists according to like the rules, according to like the, the law of God. Magic violates that law because it allows people to operate outside of God's control. And because of that, these individuals are basically breaking God's law. The Spectre responded by killing the wizard Shazam, the being that basically gives Billy Batson his powers. And because of this, Billy Batson more or less crash lands on Earth, stating to everybody, Shazam's come been completely obliterated, Shazam is now dead. Now again, the reason why a lot of this stuff is done is because of the fact that this serves the purpose of allowing DC to go forward after Infinite Crisis, treating it as a soft reboot in the sense that not everybody gets rebooted, their, their histories aren't completely rewritten, but it basically kind of allows DC to halfway hit the reset switch and kind of, you know, offer some new information or basically change people's histories a little bit, especially with the return of the multiverse. And so switching back over to the, uh, to the Justice League Watchtower, again, this is pretty small, it's not the most important thing in the world, but it's basically just the arrival of, of Mongol. Now, again, this is Mongol's son. So because of this, Mongol's more or less just kind of relishing in the idea that, that the Justice League has been, you know, been defeated more or less, that they have no trust in one another. Because remember, Mongol's one of the most formidable foes of the Justice League in general, and alongside Cyborg Superman, had eradicated Coast City, which set Hal Jordan on the path of declaring himself as Parallax and becoming a bad guy and during the events of Zero Hour, Crisis in Time. And so because of this, again, it's really just kind of a reminder of how dark things are, simply due to the 
fact that in the midst of this conflict, Wonder Woman goes to kill Mongol. Now, what you, one of the things you may notice here is that this comic, this story as it starts is very dark. It's a very, very dark story. It's designed to be that way. Jeff Johns wrote this explicitly. And the reason why is because of the fact that it's no secret Jeff Johns harkens for an age when comic books were a lot more lighthearted, uh, you know, especially with what we're seeing right now with like the Superman comics and DC Rebirth. Jeff Johns is really more of a fan of like the Silver Age of comics, the 1950s, 1960s, you know, going into the 1970s when the Bronze Age started. The idea for, for Jeff Johns was to basically say there was a time when superheroes were very lighthearted, when superhero stories were fun, when they were upbeat, when they lifted you up instead of making you feel like you've been pulled down. And what Jeff Johns is basically doing with this, you know, by virtue of talking through Superboy Prime, Earth 2, Superman, so on and so forth, is he's basically saying because of the fact that comics have become a little more realistic, because of the fact that comics are a little more visceral and a little more real, the magic has essentially been lost. There is no, wow, Superman is someone to look up to. Now it's Superman is dark, you know, Wonder Woman's dark, Batman's dark. You know, what we need is a return to greatness. And so it's almost like you can really go back and look at the history of Jeff John's various works in, in DC Comics. And I'm not going to run them all off because there's so many of them, but you can look at like, you know, the Flash, you can look at, you know, Green Lantern, you can look at the New 52 Justice League. You can trace all these things that Jeff John's has done all the way up to the start of, Re of DC Rebirth and basically see the point he's making and see his efforts to return DC Comics to more of a uplifting place as opposed to one that's a little too real and a little too visceral. And so in response to everything that's gone on, what we basically have are these hidden individuals saying enough is enough. This is it. This is done. We need to do something. We have to step in. And this is when we learn that this is Earth 2 Superman, Superboy Prime, Alexander Luther, and Lois Lane. So this is actually a really, really cool development because when this first happened, it was like, what? It was like, oh my God, it was one of the coolest things ever to take place in this in this particular story. And so because of this, what this does is this allows us to segue for a second to a story called Villains United. Now again, Villains United was a six issue miniseries that was a lead up or at least part of the lead up to uh, Infinite Crisis. But like a lot of the lead ups, it wasn't necessarily the story itself was intrinsic. It was what came out of the story that was important. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of skipped over it. I mean, if there was something in the story that was significant, that was wildly important, then I would say, okay, we'll go through the whole thing. But we can really just kind of point to the story itself and highlight the finer points as opposed to run through the entire thing. Now, with regards to this, uh, with, with, with regards to Villains United, what this was was basically Lex Luthor reforming the, the Secret Six. Now, I mean, there was like the super, you know, the secret society of supervillains and so on and so forth, but the Secret Six was more of like an inner circle uh, of that particular organization, but it was Lex Luthor leading the group and basically bringing all these villains together for the purpose of attacking the superheroes. And so what was going on in the lead up to Infinite Crisis is you had the OMAC project, these robots running around trying to annihilate heroes and villains. And then you had the Secret Six trying to annihilate superheroes. And so because of this, in the middle of this fight, we end up having Power Girl, who's basically met by the arrival of Earth 2 Superman. Now, hearkening back to the beginning of this video, when we talked about like Earth 2, and we talked about the multiverse and so on and so forth, Power Girl was a character who was introduced before Crisis on Infinite Earths. Her character is a direct reflection of the various struggles DC's faced with regards to continuity issues following Crisis on Infinite Earths. Because of the fact that she was the cousin of Superman from Earth 2, when when Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, what DC did is they went forward and treated things like the multiverse never existed. Well, if the multiverse never existed according to DC, but Power Girl was still present after Crisis on Infinite Earths, then where did she come from? Because Superman is supposed to be the only survivor of Krypton. There is no Supergirl, none of that stuff. And so the question is, who is she? Where does she come from? DC tried to go back and re-explain her origins, but it was an absolute mess. It was an absolute nightmare. And so what Jeff Johns is doing here is he's basically saying all the nonsense with origin stories and all that jargon and all that garbage that came after Crisis on Infinite Earths is being removed in its entirety. What he does by having Earth 2 Superman meet Power Girl is basically take her over to, you know, this uh, base of operations where Superboy Prime and Alexander Luther, where they're all operating out of, and Earth 2 Superman basically recounts the entirety of Crisis on Infinite Earths for Power Girl. Now, because of the fact that this information is given to her in conjunction with physically touching, you know, these individuals, what ends up happening is her entire history is restored to her. And so she basically remembers 
all of her history, you know, after Crisis on Infinite Earths. And so it's basically Jeff Johns, again, essentially saying the origin of Power Girl before Crisis on Infinite Earths is now her origin story. That's now the basis behind her character. Now, the other half of this is that it's also her basically realizing she's re-encountering a long lost cousin, the person that she knew, the person that she trusted, the person who effectively adopted her in a lot of ways, treated her like a daughter. And so because of this, this is a very uh, celebratory moment between the two of them. But in the midst of all this, we actually switch back over to uh, to Batman himself. Now, again, this deals a lot with regards to, you know, all these different, you know, the, the OMAC project and so on and so forth. But is Batman trying to keep things back under control? Batman trying to, to basically corral things back unto himself. And the reason why is because of the fact that Batman is nothing if not a man who believes that he can take on the world and keep it under control. That's one of the reasons why we like his character so much is because he is basically the epitome of a control freak. But the way it works itself out is that in this instance with Brother Eye and the OMAC project, Batman can can't stop it. Batman can't do it on his own. Instead, he's going to have to turn to other people. He's going to have to return, you know, turn to other superheroes, individuals who can help him out. And so what ends up happening here is we transition back over to Earth 2 Superman. And this is when we learn the real motivation for why they're here. With Earth 2 Superman, Superboy Prime, Alexander Luther, all these guys looking at the superhero landscape, you know, while they were in the Paradise Dimension, what they've done is they've come to the realization that these superheroes are not superheroes. And so the idea is to basically eliminate the entirety of everybody on this earth, eradicate it completely, bring earth two back, and then resurrect these individuals as their earth two counterparts. So essentially saying, we're going to get rid of you as you exist now, and we're going to bring you back as better and happier people. Now, the crazy thing about this is that Power Girl has loyalty issues at this point, and we'll actually see what those loyalty issues are. But for the moment, we can kind of get away with simply saying that she's basically stuck between the superheroes that she's fought alongside so much, the loyalty she has to them, but in addition to that, the loyalty she has to earth two Superman and her desire to see things go back to being, you know, a better time to, you know, to see superheroes becoming better people. And so what ends up happening here is that with Batman basically struggling with the idea that Brother Eye is the most colossal failure that he's had in the sense of the program that he did, that he designed completely ran amok. With Batman, you know, hearkening back to the death of Jason Todd, with Batman looking at the death of his parents, what he sees is failure after failure after failure. And the interesting thing about this, the way Jeff Johns writes this, is that he's actually not wrong. When it comes to the character of Bruce Wayne, when it comes to the character of Batman, he's had a lot of successes. Dick Grayson was a great success. Barbara Gordon being shot, Batman feels like that's a failure on his behalf. The Jokers, various schemes, all the people who have died because of the fact that he simply just didn't kill all his villains outright, Batman considers those to be failures. The death of Jason Todd, Batman's failure. Again and again and again, when Batman could have stepped in and done the right thing, he always did the wrong thing in his mind. And so because of this, he's on the verge of basically giving up. And in fact, he goes as far as to say, I wish I could start over. And almost like a, like a genie popping out of a bottle, Earth 2 Superman arrives on the scene and basically says, I can help you with that. Now, the funny thing about this is that Batman's like, you're not the Superman that I know. And Superman's like, I know, I'm from, I'm Superman essentially from Earth 2. And so again, these two basically end up having a conversation with one another. And the conversation goes as far as Earth 2 Superman basically saying, here's what we're going to do. I mean, you know, I come from a totally different place. I come from a universe called Earth 2. The universe has long since been gone, but I want to bring it back. On my universe, on my Earth in Earth 2, superheroes were something to aspire to. You know, superheroes were something to celebrate. Superheroes weren't feared by society. Superheroes didn't consider themselves to be failures. They made mistakes, but in the end, they always ended up doing the right thing. There was no moral ambiguity. There was no, well, maybe he's a good guy, maybe he's a bad guy. There were no anti-heroes. There was right, there was wrong, and if you weren't right, you were wrong. And that's the coolest thing about this is because it's very rigid, it's very structured, but in a lot of ways, it's also Jeff Johns kind of pointing at his own desires and essentially saying that, yes, I I love the Silver Age of comics, but it may not necessarily be, you know, exactly as I remember it. So again, there's a lot of nostalgia feel going on in this particular, uh, this particular bit, you know, nostalgia feels, <laughs> you know, going on in this little particular bit of a story. But what ends up happening here is what we do is we basically have, you know, Lex Luthor meeting Lex Luthor. Now, this seems to come out of left field, but the reason why this is the case is because of the fact that during the Villains United story, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to just sort of hold this off, during the Villains United story, Lex Luthor, as he had basically reformed the Secret Six, was not Lex Luthor. This was actually Alexander Luthor. And one of the things that we end up finding out here is that over the course of the time in which they were watching the various superheroes from the Paradise Dimension, Alexander Luthor and Superboy Prime were leaving the Paradise Dimension and they were showing up inside the, you know, the, the superhero landscape in DC Comics and they were basically setting the stage to give them justification to go to Earth 2 Superman and say, look how bad they are. Look how much they're failing. Those aren't superheroes. 
we need to fix this. And so because of that, what ends up happening here is that with, you know, Alexander Luther confronting Lex Luther, Alexander Luther immediately overpowers him and essentially removes him from the equation. Now, what Jeff Johns does is he starts to show us how these guys are not necessarily, you know, Earth 2 Superman and so on and so forth, how they're not necessarily the great and magical superheroes that we remember. And this is why I say Jeff Johns is kind of pointing at his own case of nostalgia. He's kind of pointing at his own case and saying, just because we remember things a certain way doesn't mean they are that way. And so with Earth 2 Superman basically approaching Bruce Wayne, he's like, look, man, change is coming. Either this change can be easy or this change can be painful, but change is coming. It's better to be on the devil's right hand than in his path. And so because of this, Superman, you know, Earth 2 Superman basically says, look, this is going to happen. We're going to eliminate you and we're going to replace you with something better. Make it easier on yourself. Now, of course, Batman's response is to use kryptonite. And this is when Jeff John steps in and basically sets the stage for how Superboy Prime is going to wreck the world. What is up happening here is Earth 2 Superman tells Batman, that's kryptonite that Earth 1 Superman gave you, but it doesn't work on me because it's not the kryptonite from my universe. So this is really interesting. This is really cool. For those of you guys who are following Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, this basically works in the exact same fashion as the Infinity Gauntlet. The Infinity Gauntlet can only be used in the universe that the Infinity Stones come from. Kryptonite can only work on, you know, the same universe as a Superman that it comes from. So Earth 1 Kryptonite works on Earth 1 Superman. Earth 2 Kryptonite works on Earth 2 Superman. Earth 1 Kryptonite will not work on Earth 2 Superman. Now, the reason why this is important is because as we saw in our video on the origin of Superboy Prime, Krypton was obliterated in its entirety. Kryptonite are basically just radioactive shards of Krypton. Because of the fact that, that Krypton from, from Earth Prime was totally disintegrated by the sun, there is no green Kryptonite from Earth Prime. And so there is no weakness for Superboy Prime. And that's why I say things are kind of crazy when it comes to this, or at least there's no weakness, uh, no weakness initially. Now, of course, Alexander Luther making his presence known to Lex Luthor really just serves the purpose of allowing him to topple Lex Luthor. I mean, that, that's that's really all there is to it. But at this point, what ends up happening is we basically have Power Girl, you know, after she's going through her own bit of, uh, you know, own bit of, of struggle, trying to figure out what direction she was going to go in, whose side she was going to choose. What she did is she came to a middle ground and said, what we can do is we can't just show up on the doorstep of all the superheroes that exist right now and say, we're going to eradicate you and replace you with something better. What she says is we have to work out a compromise. There's no reason why these two universes can't exist at the same time. So again, this is Jeff Johns setting up the return of the multiverse. But what ends up happening here is when she returns back to the headquarters of everyone, she basically ends up discovering that all these different individuals, Martian Manhunter when he was taken, Black Adam when he was kidnapped, all of them have been attached to this massive pillar, this huge obelisk that seems to have been constructed out of the remains of the Anti-Monitor. Now again, what Jeff Johns is doing here is Jeff Johns is basically saying, look, the Anti-Monitor is still a thing that existed. Crisis on Infinite Earths happened. The anti uh, Anti-Monitor is a concept. It's not something that, that I'm basically wiping out in its entirety, but this is about the extent that we get with the Anti-Monitor himself. In terms of the Anti-Monitor actually coming back as we know him, that'll be done as part of uh, Jeff John's Sinestro Core War, but it'll actually come out of the reformation of the multiverse from Infinite Crisis. But what we end up doing here is we end up finding out that with Alexander Luther and Superboy Prime being the true individuals behind the destruction, or I guess really, you know, the all this this damage and all these, these evil deeds, of course, what's basically happening is they have effectively become bad guys. Now, what this does is it begs the question, are they really bad guys or are they good guys? The funny thing about this is that their actions are given to us by virtue of what we see around them. You know, we see them kidnapping heroes. We see them, you know, hooking them up to giant obelisks. We see them with the intention of bringing the multiverse back, but wiping out all the different heroes and, and so on and so forth. But it also, you know, it's, it's like this, like a hypothetical scenario. If I came to you and I brought you over to the side of a lake and I said, in five minutes, this guy who's fishing right now is going to be killed by a man who comes up behind him and slips his, uh, you know, slips his throat. Five minutes later, exactly what I predicted would happen. Somebody comes up behind the fisherman, slices his throat, and that's the end of him. Now, on the surface, it's, well, that guy killed the fisherman. He's an evil man. But what if I told you the reason why he slit that fisherman's throat is because that murderer is trying to feed his family and he's doing it the only way he knows how because he doesn't know how to fish. Sure, the question could be asked, why didn't he ask the fisherman to teach him how to fish? But he was thinking in the moment he was doing what he thought was right. And that's why I say things are kind of interesting. But then it also brings into play the idea of results. It brings into play the idea of motivation. Sure, what they want to do is the right thing, but how they go about it is important too. And if what they do is basically start kidnapping all these different superheroes with the intention of channeling their power into a single pillar, which in turn will restore the multiverse, then are they really good guys? And so again, with Power Girl basically learning about all this, this is when Alexander Luther essentially says, take her out. If, if you're not with us, you're against us. And so at this point, Power Girl is basically an enemy. But what we also 
also end up finding here is again, we basically end up learning that Lois Lane, one of the motivations behind the Earth 2 Superman is that Lois Lane is essentially dying. You know, Earth 2 Lois Lane is basically dying. And so Earth 2 Superman was in a vulnerable state. Alexander Luther began to prey on that. And what Alexander Luther said, you know, was basically kind of whispering, you know, evil deeds, you know, on the shoulders of Superman and essentially saying, hey, look, man, if we can bring back Earth 2, Lois Lane will live. We'll keep her alive. Now, all this did was feed Alexander Luther's purpose of trying to basically restore the multiverse and create a perfect Earth. The issue with this is that with Superboy Prime standing alongside Alexander Luther, Superboy Prime's motivation is much, much simpler. Superboy Prime isn't looking for some grandiose thing. He's not looking to take over all things in existence, at least not right now. Superboy Prime's motivation is that he hates Connor Kent. And the reason why is because of the fact that Connor Kent carries the mantle of Superboy, but Connor Kent is not being Superboy. Superboy Prime basically looks at everything that's happened and says, we sacrificed our existence. We sacrificed our lives in order to create a better world for all these superheroes to live in. And all they're doing is squandering it. All they're doing is refusing Using to be superheroes. All they're doing is fighting among one another. All they're doing is screwing everything up. And so in Superboy's, you know, Superboy Prime's mind, Connor Kent is not Superboy. And if he's not going to act like Superboy, he doesn't deserve to live as Superboy. And so again, Superboy Prime's whole motivation is just personal. I mean, it's, it's basic and it's personal. But the cool thing about it is we get to see him destroy everyone. And so again, what ends up happening here is that with Lois Lane, Earth 2 Lois Lane, continuing to succumb to her various, you know, her illness, uh, what ends up happening is of course earth 2 superman arrives on the scene alexander luther says hey look man just chill here chill here hang out with her everything will be fine the other half of this is that with power girl having been subdued the dog is let off his leash superboy prime says look let me go find connor kent let me deal with connor kent alexander luther says okay now up until this point it's been standard comics explained ladies and gentlemen of the rob corps things are about to pop off all right so the cool thing here <laughs> God, I've been I've been waiting for this. I've, I've I had to explain everything in order to make it make sense. I've been waiting for this moment right now. Superboy Prime rolls up on Connor Kent's home, and the crazy thing about this is Connor Kent doesn't know who he is. Superboy Prime's, you know, when Connor Kent's like, "Who are you?" Superboy Prime's response is, "I'm the Superboy the world needs." You know, I'm the Superboy the world deserves. You are not Superboy. Now, of course, the funny thing, the, the funniest thing about this is Connor Kent tries to hold his own, right? Like Connor Kent's just like, man, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm gonna take him out. Connor Kent starts punching back, so on and so forth. Superboy Prime's response is, man, you better come strong. Dude, he wrecks Connor Kent, absolutely crushes him. And that's the craziest thing about this is because it's just Superboy Prime in unbridled rage. It's just the wrath of Superboy Prime. That's all this is. Now, of course, with the fact that, that Connor Kent's been damaged and the fact that he's engaged in this massive conflict and he's essentially losing, he sends out an SOS to the Titans. Now, the funny thing about this is like Cassie Sandsmark, like Wonder Girl, all right? Cassie Sandsmark shows up. Hey guys, I brought the Titans and the Teen Titans and the JSA. Let's get them. Superboy Prime's like, I don't give a damn. Dude, he... <laughs> <laughs> Superboy Prime wrecks them all. Dude, that's the coolest thing about this. He's ripping off arms. He's ripping off legs. He's like, come, come, come feel me. It's the coolest thing that I've ever seen. And that's why I love this so much is because it is Superboy Prime losing his mind. And that's why so many people love his character. But the other half of this is Jeff Johns writes him so well. I mean, yeah, it's Superboy Prime vengeful. It's Superboy Prime lashing out. It's Superboy Prime wrecking everyone. But what he's doing the entire time is he's saying you're ruining me you're making me like you you're making me evil you're making me bad you're making me a corrupted person and the crazy thing is that all these heroes are just fighting off against him as best they can and it is absolutely amazing because what it does is it gives superboy prime character it gives him so much development it's tough it's prime time it gives superboy prime so much development because what he does is he doesn't see himself for what he is he doesn't see himself for what he's doing. He's a guy that's fighting the entirety of the of the Teen Titans, fighting the, the entirety of the Titans, fighting half of the Justice Society of America because in his mind, they don't deserve to be heroes. Well, who's Superboy Prime to make that declaration? Who's Superboy Prime to decide who's a hero and who's not a hero? Superboy Prime is kind of like a reflection of a lot of comic book fans who say things need to go back the way they were because the way they are now is bad. I mean, bad according to you, but not bad according to everyone. And so because of that, you know, Superboy Prime has a lot of build here. And that's what makes it so cool is because this entire fight happens over the span of, you know, five or six pages. 
is, but the way that it's done is so cool. And that's why I think Jeff Johns, you know, he's, he's an amazing writer, just because of the fact that he's so good at building characters, even if it's only in a very short amount of time. But because of the fact that, that Superboy Prime is basically this guy that no one seems to be, to be able to take out, because of the fact that Superboy Prime is just crushing person after person after person, knocking them down like dominoes. What ends up happening here, and this is, this is man, man, fanboy. Well, one of the coolest things here is that Jay Garrick, Wally West, and Bart Allen race him, try to race him into the Speed Force. Now, this is crazy because you gotta think, there are all kinds of beings that Superboy Prime has fought. And of, and of course, that's one of the reasons why Jeff Johns really seemed to choose him was because of the fact that basically Superboy Prime is Silver Age Superman. It's 1950s Superman. The Superman who is pulling a chain of planets out of a dying solar system. It's the Superman who sneezed and destroyed a solar system. You know, it, it's that version of Superman. Initially, Superboy Prime had no weaknesses when he was first introduced into DC comics. None. He wasn't weak to red sun, to red solar radiation. Kryptonite didn't exist. He wasn't weak to magic. He had no weaknesses whatsoever. And Jeff Johns plays on this. He says, look, he's faster than every version of Superman. He's stronger than every version of Superman. You know, he's more capable than all the other superheroes that he's fighting against. He's literally a one-man army who's gonna be able to stop him? But with Bart Allen, Wally West, and Jay Garrett trying to race him into the Speed Force, by God, it takes everything they have to try to push him in. But this is when Jeff John sets the stage for the return of Barry Allen. And the reason why is because try as they might, and as difficult as it may be, they can't do it on their own. So what happens? Barry Allen, reaches out from the Speed Force and pulls Superboy Prime in. And that's what's so cool, is because keep in mind, Barry Allen, after the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths, popped up from time to time. I mean, DC basically said he's still around, but we didn't know what they were going to do with him. We didn't know if he was ever gonna come back. We didn't know if he was gonna be gone forever. We had no idea what was gonna happen. The Barry Allen reaching out from the Speed Force and yanking him in is amazing because basically everybody has, or everybody's able to, to pull Superboy Prime in there. And that essentially seems to be the end of him. And so what ends up happening here is with Alexander Luther having completed this massive pillar, channeling all these energies back into himself and basically using it to reform the multiverse, what he does is he basically restores Earth 2. And so what we get is Earth 1, New Earth, and Earth 2 laying the foundation for the return of the multiverse in DC Comics. Okay, so picking up with the second half of Infinite Crisis, um, I really think that like this second half is a lot easier to digest than the first. I know with the first half, I threw a lot at you guys just because Jeff Johns, the way he writes his stories usually when it comes to like these big crossover events is like the first part is like, here's all the stuff you need to know. Then the second part is like, and we're onto the action and you get a good blend. It's just Jeff Johns was using Infinite Crisis as a way to wrap up a lot of different things, to remove a lot of different things from the DC landscape. Now, some of this was like editorial, you know, for example, when we get to the second about Dick Grayson, we'll actually find out that editorial had a different intention than what we saw in the story itself. But there were a lot of things that ended up happening behind the scenes that influenced how this story was done because DC was looking to Infinite Crisis to change things up. Now, I think this makes a really, really good talking point because at the end of the last video, we talked about how the multiverse had returned. And the idea here is that with Crisis on Infinite Earths, it was a line-wide reboot. I mean, it was, it was a hard reboot. Everything was just reset from one. With Infinite Crisis, it's not that way. Jeff Johns really just kind of comes along and says, well, you get to stay and you get to stay. You got to go, but you get to stay and you get to stay. It's really just kind of going through and basically just revitalizing characters and returning them to their roots. And this is never more so evident than when we pick up with the return of the multiverse and the restoration of Earth 2. Now, remember, Earth 2 is basically the universe where all the Golden Age heroes existed. So basically, all the superheroes, if you do Google searches or you look them up or anything, all the superheroes that were first created in the 1930s, the 1940s, and the really, really early part, like the first first five years of the 1950s, that was all golden age stuff. When the multiverse is recreated by Alexander Luther, suddenly people like Jay Garrick just begin vanishing all over the place and no one knows where they are. Of course, Earth 2 Superman, Earth 2 Lois Lane, they vanish as well. What we find out is that they've been sent to Earth 2. And so really what's happening here is Jeff Johns is basically saying after Crisis on Infinite Earths, a lot of the characters who were introduced before Crisis on Infinite Earths in the multiverse on a different Earth, they were just kind of rolled over into the main DC continuity in the 
new Earth continuity after Crisis on Infinite Earths. But because the multiverse is back, basically all these different heroes are going to the Earths where they first appeared at. So for example, we have members of the Shazam family that show up on Earth S. And the reason why is because before Crisis on Infinite Earths, the Shazam family existed on Earth S. And so that's basically what's happening here. It's just returning all these different characters back to where it was that they came from. Now, a bro like a, a huge majority, a bulk of these characters, uh, you know, characters like Bat uh, like Batsman, Batsman, I know I said Batsman in the other video, characters like Batsman, <laughs> he stays simply because of the fact that he's just a character that's so popular that his Earth 2 counterpart's not going to be found. I mean, you're only going to see him on Earth 1. He's one of these weird exceptions. Switching back over to Batman himself, the idea is that with Brother Eye having had all these different Omax and, you know, kind of running amok and so on, Batman's main focus is to basically take out these, you know, take out Brother Eye, eliminate Brother Eye from the equation, and then the Omax will fall respectively. Because remember, the Omax only exist because of the connection between Brother Eye and the Omax. As soon as Brother Eye is destroyed, these, you know, nano, uh, these, these nanobots, whatever it is that surround these normal humans, will basically deactivate, and these humans will go back to the way they were before. Now, in truth, this was just DC giving themselves an out, right? It was just a way of saying, hey, look, Brother Eye is going to be defeated, and it's not going to cost the lives of some, you know, two million people in order to do it. They're all just going to go back to the way they were before. But the other half of this is we actually have Booster Gold bringing to Batman Jamie Reyes. Now, I call him Jamie Reyes. Some some people like Joe call him Jaime Reyes. I think it really just kind of depends. I'm used to pronouncing it Jamie Reyes. I mean, that's, that's, I don't know why it would be pronounced a different way. But Jamie Reyes is basically the new Blue Beetle. Keep in mind, in Countdown to Infinite Crisis, we talked about how Ted Cord, the Blue Beetle at the time, was killed by Maxwell Lord. But the funny thing about this is that when it came to the Blue Beetle landscape, with the exception of Ted Cord, everybody has powers because of a scarab that they possess. Now, originally in DC Comics, the Blue Beetle was a, a man named Dan Garrett. Dan Garrett's history is a little fuzzy. If you go to like Fox Feature Syndicate or you were to look up Fox Feature Syndicate, what you would find out is that Blue Beetle at that point in time was more akin to like a detective or something along the lines of like, you know, Green Hornet, you know, something similar to that, as opposed to the Blue Beetle that you most commonly think of. But the idea here is that when Blue Beetle Dan Garrett was effectively taken over by uh, DC as a whole, his entire history and origin was revamped to a degree to where it was similar, but he actually had powers that were derived from a scarab. And the scarab effectively went away when Ted Cord became the new Beetle. And the reason why is because of the fact that DC was looking for a more grounded character. So the Blue Beetle scarab simply just existed as like a trophy in the room or really in the, the base of operations for Ted Cord. And Ted Cord himself had no actual powers. He was just a super smart guy. But what ended up happening is because of the fact that Infinite Crisis was designed to fulfill Jeff John's desire to take a lot of comics or as many as he could in terms of characters and send them back to their roots. When we eventually saw Ted Cord stumble across the wizard Shazam and his efforts to figure out, you know, what was going on with Maxwell Lord, Ted Cord was killed. The Blue Beetle scarab was left on Shazam when the Rock of Eternity was destroyed by the specter, the, the beetle scarab landed on Earth and then took possession of Jamie Reyes. And so what that meant is that Jamie Reyes went forward as the new Blue Beetle with powers. Now, the caveat to all this is that within this story, Infinite Crisis, and even going into like 52 and going into a lot of stories that focus on his character, the issue is that Jamie Reyes does not have any control of the Blue Beetle scarab. It operates with a will of its own. It's more instinctive or reactive than anything else. And so because of this, this is basically introducing his character into DC and showing us, or at least giving us an idea of what to expect. Now, of course, Booster Gold bringing in Jamie Reyes to uh, to Batman is done because of the fact that, remember, Booster Gold is a time traveler, and in his future, he already knows about the events that are going on right now, and what he tells Batman is, you're going to try to find Brother Eye, you're not going to be able to find it, but the Blue Beetle Scarab can help you locate it because of the fact that it can allow its user to, to almost do anything they need to at any particular point in time. It's almost like the last white event with, um, you know, Starbrand, for those of you guys who were familiar with Jeff, or not with Jeff, John, with Jonathan Hickman's uh, Avengers and New Avengers. Uh, but the fact remains here that basically what Booster Gold says is Blue Beetle will help you find Brother Eye because you will not be able to locate it on your own. And so at this point, what we do is we switch back over to Earth 2. Now, with regards to Earth 2, we focus largely on Superman. And the idea was, remember, he was told by Alex Land uh, Alexander Luther, if we restore the multiverse, then Lois Lane and you, you guys can go back to Earth 2 and Lois Lane will live simply because of the fact that she was dying for reasons that we couldn't necessarily, like really weren't really explained. It was just kind of like the idea of old age or something along those lines. But despite being on Earth 2, Lois Lane dies anyway. Now, this is one of the most touching moments of the story. And the reason why is because of the fact that it is an absolute law of the universe that Superman always rescues Lois Lane. Superman could be in a village of children who are being bombarded by conventional warfare, and he will leave to save Lois Lane. But the idea here is this is Golden Age Superman. This is 1930s, 1940s, incorruptible Superman. Back in those days, he 
always saved Lois Lane. That was the crux of the story. Will Superman get to Lois Lane in time? Find out in the next issue. That was the way those stories were written back then. And so with Lois Lane dying, this is an experience that Earth 2 Superman has never felt before. There's never been an instance where he's ever had to even question whether or not Lois Lane was going to survive. He was always there. But with her death, with the scream that he lets out, the fact that he's feeling this much suffering and this much pain, it breaks the barrier between Earth 1 and Earth 2. And Superman on Earth 1 hears it. And that's how much suffering goes into the chat. That's how much suffering goes into the screen. Now, again, this is Jeff Johns kind of tying up all these loose ends and having, you know, really going forward with the intention of returning superheroes back to the way they're supposed to be. Now, we'll find out with Final Crisis, a lot of that ends up getting changed by Grant Morrison. But what ends up happening here is we transition over to Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman of Earth 1 is actually visited by Wonder Woman of Earth 2, the Golden Age Wonder Woman. And the cool thing about this is that the Golden Age Wonder Woman takes Earth 1 Wonder Woman, you know, Diana, on this journey where she basically explains, look, you're not a hero right now. You're not acting like a hero. You don't need to prove yourself to anybody. Like you've been a leader. You've been a queen. You know, you have been an ambassador. You've done virtually everything. The only thing you need to be right now is human. And that's the coolest thing about this because what Jeff Johns is basically saying is that in a lot of ways, the modern superheroes at the time this story was written, 2005, 2006, the superheroes had lost their humanity. They weren't superheroes anymore. It was almost like you could write this story as a precursor to Injustice Gods Among Us, right? Like they lose their humanity. They lose what it is that makes them heroes. And because of this, they basically fight amongst each other. I mean, in the Injustice universe, you know, they fight amongst each other, so on and so forth. In this story, it's a lot of the same way. They've lost their humanity. And in sight of losing their humanity, they fail to take into account that the actions that they engage in, especially Wonder Woman when she killed Maxwell Lord, have an impact that resonates beyond herself. Humanity won't say, well, oh my God, Wonder Woman killed Maxwell Lord. Wonder Woman is a terrible person. No, 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 no. What humanity will say is Wonder Woman killed Maxwell Lord. Wonder Woman's part of the Justice League. Superheroes are dangerous. That's exactly the way the events played out. And that's the case that Earth 2 Wonder Woman is making. Be a hero. Be human. Understand everyone makes mistakes. You've made mistakes. Batman makes mistakes. Superman makes mistakes. Learn from them and become a better person. And so because of this, we transition back over to Superman on Earth 2, and we end up having this really cool battle between himself and Superman on Earth 1. And that's kind of the funny thing here, because it's almost like experience versus experience. Which one comes, comes out right here? But the funny thing about this is that it's actually Superman from Earth 1 that talks reason into Golden Age Superman. And the reason why I say that is because of the fact that Golden Age Superman is fighting out of anger. He's fighting out of wrath. He's fighting out of rage. And the reason why is he says Lois Lane didn't die because it was unavoidable. Lois Lane died because she was exposed to the corruption that is what makes you superheroes who you are. She was exposed to the corruption of your evil deeds. She was exposed to the corruption of your moral ambiguity, your willingness to do things that, that would basically make you a villain as opposed to being a hero. Now, the funny thing about this is Wonder Woman steps in. Wonder Woman basically says, look, you know, you guys have to stop. And this is when Golden Age Superman really lets him have it. He says, you're not heroes. Not not in any sense of the word. You're anti-heroes. You're questionable heroes. Sometimes you do good things, but it doesn't atone for the bad things you do. And that's really what, that, that, that's the funny thing about this is a case could be made for that. Now, somebody in the comment section of the video about the uh, OMAC project made a really good point where they were basically saying, look, if all the old stories were nothing but heroes doing the right thing all the time, that would get boring. Hence the reason why we started getting stories like the Dark Knight Returns and stuff like that, where we started seeing the darker side of heroes. But what Jeff Johns is saying is that is something that needs to be there. There needs to be a time when the, the morality of superheroes is questioned, when the morality of superheroes is ambiguous. That's something that needs to exist. The problem is when it becomes the status quo. That's the issue. Superheroes should always be something to look up to. They should always be something to aspire to. The humanity of heroes is what bridges the gap between them as, you know, comic book characters and us as the reader, and it's what helps us identify with them. But what we don't want to read are stories where all we see is dark and drabby. What we don't want to see are stories where either it reflects the real world or it makes the real world look worse than it is. And so because of that, Superman says, you've lost your way. Now, the best counter argument to this is Superman from Earth 1. When Golden Age Superman's ranting on and he's talking about how he comes from a world where everything's perfect, Superman from Earth 1 says, well, that can't be possible because a perfect world wouldn't need a Superman. And so that's the beauty of all this is because this is when Golden Age Superman begins to put two and two together. When he begins talking about, you know, how Alexander Luther's trying to find that one perfect Earth, this is when Golden Age Superman realizes Alexander Luther is working against them. And so what 
we end up finding out is that with this giant tower that's been built, you know, with, uh, you know, I guess a resemblance to the anti-monitor that Alexander Luther kind of switches over and basically says that for reasons that he can't begin to comprehend, for reasons he doesn't understand, the multiverse begins and ends with Superman. Now, there is an actual reason for this, but it's not tied directly into the comics. It's not like the multiverse was born directly from Superman in DC Comics. He's not the origin of the multiverse. The reason behind this actually goes all the way back to the 1950s. So going on a bit of a journey here, kind of of, of time traveling a bit, uh, back in the 19, you know, 1930s, 1940s, when Superman first showed up in comics, um, he could just jump really high, run really fast, and bullets could bounce off of him. But as time progressed, and especially, you know, being influenced by his radio show, where Kryptonite was introduced for the first time, and uh, with the, you know, the, the Fleischer Studios, where they basically introduced the ability for him to fly, those were rolled over into the comics, but no explanation was given. It was just one day he could jump really high, the next day he could fly, and we didn't know why. And so what DC did is they came back in 1956 with Barry Allen, and they said, well, you know, that was a different universe. That was Earth 2. Earth 1 is the universe that has the Flash Barry Allen. Now, because of this, what uh, what Jeff Johns is doing is using Alexander Luther as a meta commentary by basically saying that it does all begin and end with Superman. The questions of, you know, the questions that led to DC introducing the multiverse all stemmed from the radical change in Superman's powers that were never explained. And so again, it's really just one of those funny kind of meta commentary things. But for those of you guys who are impatient, those of you guys who are tired of waiting, those of you guys who are like, I want to see Superboy Prime, this is when we get him. So the funny thing about this is that because a majority or at least a lot of the different heroes that have ex existed on Earth that were originally created in, you know, the, the Golden Age and had their own universes, because they've been switched back over to those universes, the ranks of the Titans and the Teen Titans have been absolutely decimated. I mean, half their numbers are gone and they don't even know where those guys have gone to. And so because of this, it really comes down to Connor Kent and to Dick Grayson Nightwing to try to fend off, destroy this tower and basically converge all the different Earths back into uh, back into to New Earth. And so what we do is we switch over to Tokyo and we actually pick up with Bart Allen. Now, the funny thing about this is that it's not initially explained here. Instead, we just have Bart Allen emerging from the Speed Force as an adult wearing the Flash costume. And he begins just kind of rambling on and going on about nonsense, talking about how we couldn't hold him. We couldn't keep him contained. The question is asked, well, who are you talking about? And he says, it's him. It's Superboy Prime. So Superboy Prime has re-emerged from the Speed Force. God, I love this story, man. This is, let me, man, let me, man, let me tell you something, dude. I, I love, I love, God, I love Infinite Crisis, man. I love this story so much. So the funny thing is switching back over to Batman, uh, Booster Gold and and uh, and Blue Beetle. Again, this is just kind of a, a re-familiarity. It's reminding us of the power of this new Blue Beetle in the sense that he can basically vibrate through dimensional barriers. He can, uh, he can also reveal things that are hidden between dimensional barriers. Now, what this does is it basically deactivates the cloaking device of Brother Eye, and it allows Batman and everybody else to basically stow aboard and begin the process of trying to shut Brother Eye down. And so we just get all these little sequences, these small little subplots converging into one another to lead to the conclusion of the story. Really the last fight with Superboy Prime, uh, within Infinite Crisis anyway. But the funny thing is also switching over to Stonehenge, it's grabbing what's left of all the superheroes on Earth, and the Spectre suddenly appears and ends up destroying Deborah Carmille Darnell. Now, the reason why Deborah Carmille Darnell, Deborah, Deborah, the reason why Deborah was, was, was destroyed, Deborah, oh my God, Star Sapphire Deborah. The reason why she was destroyed <laughs> is because of the fact that she is currently Star Sapphire around the time of Infinite Crisis. But Jeff Johns is going to go forward in the Green Lantern mythos and rework the entirety of the Star Sapphire mythos. And so he's basically like, she's in the way. She's not going to be part of the story that I'm making. We're just going to get rid of her. And that's it. She's gone. No must, no fuss. Nobody really even asks any questions. It's just like, and she's gone now. And that's it. So... <laughs> it was just one of those funny little moments that sort of gets wrapped in there. But what we end up doing here is we basically switch over to Alexander Luther continuing to experiment with the multiverse itself. This idea that, that Superman and Lex Luthor will, are destined to always be at odds with one another. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people who are reading DC Rebirth right now believe that Lex Luthor in the New 52 is going to go back to being a bad guy simply because of the fact that they read stories like Infinite Crisis. They see these lines that Jeff Johns threw out, the guy who wrote Infinite Crisis and is now the one controlling DC Rebirth. And they see things where Alex Alexander Luther says Superman and Lex Luthor are always destined to fight one another. So again, it's all these really cool moments. What we end up finding out is that with uh, with Cassie Sands, Mark Wonder Girl, basically joining alongside Dick Grayson and uh, and Connor Kent Superboy to free all these different superheroes who have been attached to the tower, that Martian Manhunter, Power Girl, they all begin to join the fray. And it's this mad dash to face off against uh, Alexander Luther, destroy the tower and try to save the multiverse. Now, the reason why this whole act is being committed, why everything needs to be saved is because what Jeff 
Jeff Johns did is he basically established a time clock. But what he said is that with regards to the creation of the multiverse, it's not a contained thing. You can't just like bring one Earth back and then bring another Earth back and then two or three more Earths back. Then what you do is you start a chain reaction. You become a prime mover, you initiate the creation of the multiverse, and then suddenly Earths start popping up left and right. They just start activating all over the place. And it's basically an endless cycle that will lead to infinite Earths. The problem with this is that it's not created organically, it's created artificially. And so what that means is it basically invokes a half-life. Each Earth only has half the energy of the Earth that came before it, so it's diminishing returns. And what'll happen is it'll lead to Earths that are basically completely and totally unstable. And when those Earths begin to destroy, it'll create a cascading event that will basically wipe out the multiverse. And so because of that, the entire multiverse is in and of itself completely unstable. And so eventually it'll all just collapse in on itself. And so in order to keep the end of all things from happening, the tower has to be destroyed. Now, what this also does is it sees Superboy Prime showing up and just absolutely wrecking Black Adam. Now, one of the questions that I've seen asked on Twitter, different things like that, when I did the video on the origin of Superboy Prime is, does magic affect Superboy Prime? The answer to that question is no. Superboy Prime is not affected by magic. Jeff Johns confirms it in this story. Now, the other half of this is because of the fact that Superboy Prime was basically, you know, like the, the strong arm of Alexander Luther because he had killed members of the Titans, because he was such a villainous guy, what we end up having is all these different superheroes focusing their efforts on him first and then tending to Alexander Luther later. Now, switching back over to Batman again, the cool thing about this is that again, we kind of get this back and forth between Batman and uh, Batman and, and Brother I, as well as all these different superheroes facing off against Superboy Prime. But what we end up finding out is that Batman's idea, he basically says, look, I designed you physically. I may not control your software, but I designed you physically. I can activate and deactivate aspects of you. And what we end up finding out is the whole thing here is basically just a ruse. He's buying time in order to allow Mr. Terrific, the third smartest man in the world, to begin the process of activating the propulsion system for Brother I and moving him out from where he's currently located at. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that if Brother I is destabilized, it'll go towards the efforts of destroying the tower of Alexander Luther. And so again, this is really just a scenario where Brother I begins recalling all these different Omax directly to where Batman's located, and Batman in turn invokes the Green Lantern. So that's how the Green Lanterns begin getting involved in this. Now, they were already involved to a degree, but they're more so now than they were before because we basically have two major skirmishes taking place right now. We have the battle where the tower is, which is where Superboy Prime, Power Girl, Martian Manhunter, so on, and then we have this battle out in space with Brother Eye, which is Batman, Booster Gold, uh, Blue Beetle, and then like a ton, of, like a whole bunch of members of the Green Lanterns. Now, this is cool because we basically get round two of Superboy Prime facing off against Superboy. But the funny thing is here, much like the first time around, while Superboy is able to hold off, while, you know, Connor Kent's able to, to fight pretty well, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You know, Superboy Prime is still able to overpower him. Now, in a last ditch effort, you know, some kind of a, a trump card, Connor Kent flies Superboy Prime into the tower and destroys it. And what it does is it basically shatters the multiverse and then takes all these different Earths and restores them back into New Earth. And so it was almost like this, this whole, you know, explosion of Earths outward and then those Earths coming back into New Earth. So that's one of the things, if you ever do like Google searches, you ever do any research and they talk about how during Infinite Crisis, the multiverse was reborn and then destroyed, that's exactly what this means. The problem is that in the midst of its fight with Superboy Prime, Connor Kent is killed by Superboy Prime. And so again, this is kind of a crazy scenario. Now, one of the funny things about this is that Connor Kent was supposed to stay dead. The reason why he was supposed to be gone is because of the fact that, remember, Infinite Crisis serves as a soft reboot. And this is one of those instances we were talking about where Jeff Johns was deciding who gets to leave and who gets to stay you know, who gets to live and who gets to die. Connor Kent was supposed to die because he was just a holdover from the death and return of Superman. And DC just never really knew what to do with him. And in fact, if you go and read Jeff Johns, you know, his whole run on like Teen Titans, what he's basically doing is building up to this point where he would, where Connor Kent was supposed to die. The problem with this is that DC editorial didn't want to keep it that way. And in fact, he actually comes back during like, what is it, like the Legion of Three Worlds or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head what the story was called, but he, he's basically resurrected. And what ends up happening is he just gets thrown into a crypto Tony and, re, you know, regeneration matrix, and they end up bringing him back the same way they brought back the old Superman. The other half of this is that with the death of Connor Kent, this is when they basically say Superboy Prime is beyond the point of no return. Now, the other half of this equation is, remember, we still have the Secret Six, the Super Society of Secret Villains. Alexander Luther, posing as Lex Luthor, freed all these different villains from across the world, and they're all basically tearing cities apart, ripping things to pieces, just 
having a good old time. And so because of this, Earth 2 Superman and Earth 1 Superman, of course, basically take out Doomsday. And then from there, their question is, who do we take out next? And their immediate focus is Superboy Prime. But the funny thing about this is that Superboy Prime actually faces off against Bart Allen. And this is when Jeff Johns begins to hearken at one of the only two weaknesses that Superboy Prime has. The first weakness is a legitimate weakness, which we'll actually see later on here in the story. But the second is really more of like a fear or a phobia. Superboy Prime is terrified of speedsters. And the reason why is because of the fact that when Superboy Prime was forced back into the Speed Force, to his mind, he was stuck there for years. Now, in terms of the armor that he wears, this is something that Jeff Johns does not fully explain. He addresses it, but he doesn't really fully explain it. All we know is that Superboy Prime built this armor to basically absorb solar radiation into his body and to store it uh, while he was in the Speed Force. Now, the reason why this matters is because for Superman, for your average run-of-the-mill regular Superman, Superman as a whole just absorbs solar radiation. He's a solar battery, all right? His body absorbs solar radiation to the point that it just can't absorb anymore so that if he ends up going to a planet where there's like a red sun or something like that, his body will basically use up that solar radiation until there's none left and then he'll just be a regular person. The suit that Superboy Prime has takes it a step further. It's like a battery pack for solar radiation. He puts the suit on and then the suit itself absorbs solar radiation in addition to what his body already has. And so it allows him to fight longer, harder, and faster than any of the other Superman or superheroes. Now, in truth, it doesn't really matter anyway because he's already so overpowered that it almost makes the point moot. But what it does is it pushes his powers a step further. Now, with regards to the fact that he is running an absolute muck here, uh, what ends up happening is he basically leads the superheroes on a merry chase and ends up being encountered by the Green Lanterns. But before we get into that, what I want to do is I want to switch back over to uh, to Alexander Luther. And the fight with the various superheroes are subduing these members of the, of the Secret Six. What ends up happening here is that Alexander Luther goes to kill Batman and Dick Grayson jumps in the way. Now, if you go read interviews, DC will tell you Dick Grayson was supposed to die. He was not supposed to live. He was supposed to be gone. And the reason why was because of the fact that DC was looking at Dick Grayson as a whole and they said, this guy's been around since like 1940, since Detective Comics number 39 or something like that. I don't remember what issue it was off the top of my head, but he's been around for decades. I mean, he's been around for years and years and years and years. And they were like, it's time to get rid of him and replace him with someone new. The problem with this and the reason why DC was talked, about, uh, talked out of it was because there were other members in the DC camp that were like, if you kill Dick Grayson, fans will riot. Like they will lose it. You cannot kill Dick Grayson. That's one of the biggest mistakes you would have made. They would have lost their minds. So in the end, DC chose not to kill Dick Grayson and just have him have him injured really, really, really bad. <laughs> but because of the fact that Superboy Prime basically takes off to the depths of space, uh, what ends up happening here is that Hal Jordan calls in all the other Green Lanterns that are out in their various sectors, recalls them all to the location of where Superboy Prime is heading to and has them all face off. And so what we end up having is Superboy Prime versus a Guy Gardner led Green Lantern team. And let me tell you something, Rob. Let me tell you something. This is a sight to behold, dude. This is one of the coolest things ever because they're making statements, you know, like the thin green line will stop him cold. Superboy Prime's response is like, you guys don't know cold. And he starts killing just ripping them to pieces. I mean, there's there's no contest here. I mean, he's just tearing them to shreds. He crushes them so bad that the standard operating procedure of the Green Lanterns to preserve life is cast aside and they're given permission to kill Superboy Prime. Now, the reason why this is important is because if a Green Lantern, unless his permission is given, if a Green Lantern goes and tries to kill someone, the, the, the ring will stop them. The ring will keep them from doing that. That's one of the things that Jeff Johns uh, really focused on a lot when it came to the lead up to Sinestro Corps War. And during this, Sinestro Core War is that the Guardians of the Universe permanently installed in the Green Lantern Rings the ability to kill members of the Sinestro Core. Because what Sinestro did is when he made his own Lantern Core, he basically set it up so that his rings will allow members of the Sinestro Core to kill anybody. And so it was basically, you know, creating a, a, a way to counter the Green Lanterns. And so because of this, the Green Lanterns are given the ability to kill and it doesn't matter. Superboy Prime is still crushing and stomping every last one of them. Let me tell you something, man. Let me, let me tell you something. Man. If God was writing Superboy Prime right now, this is what it would look like right now. It's one of the coolest things that I've ever seen to see him just crushing all these Green Lanterns. Now, the reason why this is important is because when we pick up with Green Lantern Corps Recharge, they'll reference this moment. They'll actually talk about how he killed some 40 Green Lanterns without even trying. And so what ends up happening is that in this last ditch effort, with this recognition that Superboy Prime simply does not seem to be able to be stopped, Earth-1 Superman and Earth-2 Superman grab him and race him to the Red Sun 
from where Krypton was destroyed. Now, the funny thing about this is this is basically Jeff John showing the arrogance and how far Superboy Prime has fallen. Because in his mind, to his immediate thought, well, you know, they're taking me to Kryptonite, you know, to, to where Krypton used to be. Well, that Kryptonite doesn't affect me. Like, these guys are boneheads. They're not paying attention. Flying him through a red sun effectively begins to negate all of their powers. It destroys the armor of Superboy Prime, and then it begins to basically draw away the energies of Superman. Because remember, they start to lose their powers in the presence of a red sun. And so, like asteroids falling onto a planet, they crash onto the Green Lantern planet Mogo, and then they just they all just start duking it out. Now, in the process of all this, Superboy Prime kills Golden Age Superman, you know, or really kind of beats him to death. But the cool thing about this is that Earth-1 Superman lets Superboy Prime have it. And the reason why is because they're both in the presence of a red sun. Now, the reason why I say this is significant is because remember, in our origin story of Superboy Prime, red sun energy did not affect him. He had no weaknesses. He wasn't weak to magic. He wasn't weak to kryptonite or kryptonite didn't exist. He wasn't weak to red sun radiation. He was stronger, faster, you know, had more energy than every Superman who had ever existed. Superboy Prime was in essence 1950s 1960s silver age superman all strength no weakness in order for jeff johns to be able to just end this story he had to give him a weakness and so he basically just throws red sun radiation in there now in truth jeff johns is probably looking at the obscurity of superboy's origin in the sense that it's a very difficult story to find and unless you know where to look you'll never find it and so it's just superboy prime is just this version of superman that exists out there that's really op and so i imagine jeff johns is just kind of relying on that that obscurity in order to help him pass the story off which it works i mean it's it's, it's fine i mean superboy prime as much as i love him he's got to have a weakness you know and so it just makes sense that we would see him being being weak to, to red sun radiation. And so because of this, uh, because he's in a weakened state and his powers are effectively dwindling away, the Green Lanterns arrive just in time to basically encase him in Green Lantern energy and then whisk him off to a science cell on Oa in the center of the universe, where he's basically gonna be held prisoner in the presence of a red sun, which again, completely negates his powers. And so what ends up happening here is that with Golden Age Superman dying, it really just kind of transitions to the fallout of all these different events. And it's basically just sort of this epilogue where it continues on with things as they're heading forward you know the idea that we still have the new uh, blue beetle uh, jamie reyes you know where these characters are going to go from power girl wonder girl cassie sandsmark the new specter all these different things that are sort of coming out of infinite crisis going forward into the future of dc comics but for those things they're not really relevant to us because we're doing this strictly to help us understand what's going on in jeff john's green lantern mythos a little bit better but there's actually two epilogues that come into this story the first is that we pick up with alexander luther who survived everything he survived the whole return of the multiverse, all that kind of good stuff. When his idea is, I'm going to try again. Like one day I will try again. I'm going to recreate the multiverse and I'm going to find the perfect earth. But what ends up happening is that as he's making his way through Gotham, he's attacked and killed by the Joker. And the reason why is because the real Lex Luthor shows up and says the biggest mistake you made besides impersonating me and all that kind of stuff was that when you reformed the secret six, you didn't invite the Joker. And that's why the Joker killed him because he didn't get an invite to the party. That encapsulates Joker so well. Joker's the kind a guy to find out that somebody's having a party somebody's having like a, a great big amazing birthday party in gotham city and there's going to be all kinds of crazy stuff like an adult birthday party but there's going to be all kinds of crazy stuff he didn't get an invite so he goes in there and just shoots the place up that's the kind of thing that joker would do but the other epilogue that we get is superboy with all these different superheroes basically learning from their mistakes really their lessons from the return of these different earth 2 superman what ends up happening is that with superboy prime confined inside of the science cell he carves the superboy symbol onto his chest and then simply says, I've been in places like this before, I've been in worse, and I've always managed to get my way out. And so what this does is this segues directly into Green Lantern Recharge as part of the Jeff Johns Green Lantern mythos. Okay, uh, <laughs> the events of Dark Knight Metal basically confirm Final Crisis and tell us that Final Crisis is in the existence of DC's continuity as it stands right now. The reason why I make that declaration and make that statement is because the New 52 erased a lot of things from before 2011. A lot of things that happened in DC Comics before 2011 were eliminated in their entirety. But in order to make Dark Knight's Metal make more sense, we're gonna cover Final Crisis. Now here's the deal, Final Crisis is crazy. It is, it is, <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers because this is one of those stories where it's just like Grant Morrison just being crazy. That's really what it is. It's Grant Morrison just being insane. For those of you guys who don't know, writer Grant Morrison has this tendency to take these metaphysical concepts, these things like how we perceive good and evil, and then apply characters to them and say, this is the world. This is how it works. Kind of a weird scenario. But fortunately for us, things are not that extreme when it comes to like the final crisis story. They're just weird. <laughs> 
<laughs> is really all it is. Now, what this initially does is it picks up with a guy by the name of Dan Turbin. And Dan Turbin has been around in DC Comics for quite some time. I want to say he appeared in Detective Comics number 64 in 1941. Maybe it was 1942. And then I believe he was adjusted, like he was actually given form, given a character in the New God solo series by Jack Kirby. Um, and we'll talk more about the New Gods here uh, here in like five seconds. But the whole basis behind this, this New Gods thing is that this initially deals with the arrival of a guy named Orion. Now, Orion just kind of crash lands on Earth. But this is the first indication that a massive set of events are happening. And the reason for this is because Dan Turbin is just a detective. He's just a guy who just goes and looks at cases, different things like that. But when it comes to DC Comics, the New Gods were kind of a weird situation. When Jack Kirby originally launched the whole New Gods fourth world epic back in the 1970s, when he left Marvel Comics, the idea was to create this wholly separate imprint away from DC superhero landscape, and it would just be out there by itself in the middle of no man's land. So you would basically have DC superheroes, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, so on and so forth. And then isolated from that and never crossing over, you would have the fourth world epic, which is where you would get dark side and things along those lines. The problem with this was that Jack Kirby left before he completed the project. The rumor is that DC treated him like crap. So he ended up leaving and going back to Marvel again. And because of this, he never finished the fourth world epic. And so what DC did is they grabbed all these concepts of the new gods and then rolled them over into their main DC continuity. But in the realm of the pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths landscape, because of the fact that the fourth world was supposed to be removed from the DC continuity, while it was rolled in, it was basically established as a separate universe. Because in 1961, DC made the multiverse with Flash of Two Worlds. And so because of this, with Crisis on Infinite Earths coming along and saying, okay, there is no multiverse anymore, there's only one universe, DC had to find a way to work the new gods in as a group that was originally part of a different universe, but is now part of the main universe with all the other superheroes. And so what they did is they went through, and I believe it was in the Cosmic Odyssey series by Jim Starlin, they went through and they basically came back and said, okay, you have Apocalypse and you have New Genesis. Apocalypse is where Darkseid hangs out at, New Genesis is where his mortal enemy Highfather hangs out at, and it was all part of the universe. They were just out there in some galaxy somewhere. But eventually events took place in such a form that things like the anti-life entity, the anti-life equation, stuff like that started popping up, and it basically just walled off their galaxy. And so in effect, they were isolated in an alternate universe insofar as their galaxy wasn't able to access anything else. And DC used this as kind of a bootstrapped way to say, this is how it is they're coming into the superhero universe, but it's the reason why superheroes can't really go to them. But the fact that Orion has basically died, or at least is believed to have died, is a pretty big deal. Because new gods are beings with incredible amounts of power. And for a new god to basically just be eliminated in their entirety is something that immediately strikes a chord with anybody. It would be like if Superman just crashed on a dock somewhere and then was dead. Nobody would know why. People would be like, what in the heck happened? What in the world took place here? And so the result is that it's this huge investigation. Now, remember, because of the fact that the new gods are massive in scale, one of the big things that DC did is they came back and they launched a story called Infinite Crisis. Now, when it comes to the different crises DC's done over the course of their landscape, they're pretty straightforward. DC made the multiverse in 1961 with Flash of Two Worlds. They got rid of the multiverse with Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985. They brought the multiverse back in 2006 with Infinite Crisis. And this story, Final Crisis, makes the superheroes aware of it. But as it stands right now, post Infinite Crisis, the new gods do have their own reality. They have their own universe, that kind of a thing. But the idea is that again, with one of them being killed, this is huge news. And it actually draws the attention of everyone because everybody's aware of who the new gods are. Specifically, it draws the attention of the Green Lanterns, Jon Stewart, Hal Jordan, so on and so forth, but it also draws the attention of someone named Rene Montoya. Now, Rene Montoya was originally a character who was introduced in Batman the Animated Series, and she was rolled over in Detective Comics 475 in 1992. But the idea here is that Rene Montoya is like Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn basically showed up in Batman the Animated Series, and because the show was so popular, DC and Warner Brothers began grabbing characters that didn't didn't exist in comics and then started rolling them over into the comics. Now, Renee Montoya was just a detective. I mean, she, of course, she was gay and she had a girlfriend, different things like that, but her girlfriend was killed. And what this did is it coincided with her basically taking over the mantle of the question. I'm throwing a ton of stuff at you guys. <laughs> I'm throwing a lot of history at you guys because there's so much that goes into this. So the question was a guy named Victor Sage and he was basically created for Charlton Comics. Charlton Comics sucks. They were just one of those comic book publishers that exist out there. They went belly up in 1967 and so the question was rolled over into DC's landscape. The question Victor Sage, he was like Warshak from The Watchmen, right? Like he was just a guy who showed up. He wore this mask that hit his face and he 
just beat the crap out of criminals at night. <laughs> That's really what he was. He was almost like Batman in a lot of those ways. The idea was that Victor Sage ended up dying and his student at the time, for the most part, Rene Montoya took over the mantle. And this is because of the fact that Rene Montoya's girlfriend had died and she had become an alcoholic. But it was a way for DC to take a character who was originally popular in Batman the Animated Series, but had long since lost her popularity and basically rework her in a way that fans would actually care about her. So she doesn't play a significant role, but I figured I'd drop that little tidbit of knowledge here for you guys. I mean, she basically tells Dan Turbin, hey, the questions that you're asking for with all these kids who are vanishing is in a place called the Dark Side Club. Now, of course, this also coincides with, you know, Hal Jordan talking with Jon Stewart about the idea that Orion has been killed. The problem with this was that when Jon Stewart originally tried to get a hold of Hal Jordan after the, you know, 10-11 came in, basically the warning to the Green Lanterns that a god had been killed and somebody needed to investigate, Jon Stewart was not able to get a hold of Hal Jordan. And that's a very important thing. But what we end up doing is jumping to a group called the Secret Society of Supervillains. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's just supervillains. <laughs> All hanging out, scheming, trying to find ways to defeat heroes, different things like that. But one of these characters crops up as a guy named Libra. Now, Libra's had virtually no important aspects in DC Comics at all. This guy did, I think he appeared in like some Justice League story, like 111 through 114 or something like that. And that was it. The fact that Libra is here is interesting because we initially don't know why. All we know is that Libra basically makes the case, hey, I am going to give you guys your heart's desires. I'm going to basically give you guys everything you want to prove that you guys should hand over control of the secret society of supervillains to me. And then in turn, I can lead us down the path of destroying all the heroes who were out there. Now, in truth, the secret society is really just kind of like, whatever. <laughs> and there's no reason for them to believe this because for a guy like Libra to suddenly pop up out of nowhere, who's basically had no meaningful escapades whatsoever and say, I'm the answer to all your problems is nonsense. It's like if you're walking down the road one day and some guy walks up to you and says, hey, I can make all your wildest dreams come true. If you're a fool, you'll follow him. But if you have any measure of common sense, you'll be like, get out of here. That's ridiculous. But in order to prove that he can actually do what it is that he says he can do, he ends up killing Martian Manhunter. Now, this is where the death of Martian Manhunter comes from. For those of you guys who are following our Green Lantern videos on Sundays, and we picked up with Blackest Night, where, where Martian Manhunter comes back as a Black Lantern. He basically comes back from the dead. But in this instance, there was a prison that was created for supervillains. And the idea was that Martian Manhunter had basically infiltrated the prison to really just kind of keep an eye on things and report back to the Justice League. But Libra had known about this. Of course, this was also because of the fact that Catwoman had figured things out and basically told Libra what was going on. But in response, when Martian Manhunter was attacked by the prisoners inside the prison itself and then quote unquote whisked away by Libra, he's effectively killed. Because remember, at this point in time, Martian Manhunter has a literal weakness to fire. And so the result of this is that Martian Manhunter is dead and it proves to the various members of the Secret Society of Supervillains that they can actually pull this off. Now, what this does is this follows up with Turpin and it officially jumps into the introduction of Darkseid. What this does is it picks up with a guy who's just referred to as Boss Darkseid. And the idea that these various kids have basically been brought under Darkseid's control. Now, we're not initially told how it was that this had happened. Instead, we just knew these kids were being controlled by Boss Darkseid and that was really about it. In truth, this is due to the fact that these kids are under the influence of the anti-life equation. Now, we'll talk more about the anti-life equation in the next video. The long and short of it for right now is that the anti-life equation is basically just this equation that if a person cracks it, if they figure it out, they can dominate the wills of others. They can basically bend others to their control with an almost absolute control. But that's basically what we're being told here, that dark side has managed to figure out a way to crack the anti-life equation. The other half of this and a story that was covered, or I guess events that were covered in DC Universe number zero is that there was a war among the new gods and that dark side had quote unquote, died. In truth, his spiritual essence had just been thrown into the body of a normal person. So it's very similar to the idea of like Ragnarok from, from Marvel Comics. Thor dies, all the Asgardians die, and they're reborn in human bodies, and Thor has to run around and wake them up, bring about their true selves. And the difference here is that these guys who have been reborn on Earth in human bodies, when their spiritual essences were teleported to that location, they know who they are. They're simply just biding their time and trying to find a way to conquer the Earth. And so what we end up doing here is picking up with a 
the Justice League following the death of Orion and the investigation into how it happened. Now, what this does is it brings into sharp relief something called the Alpha Lanterns. There was a story that basically dealt with the idea of the Sinestro Corps, the you know Yellow Lanterns created by Thal Sinestro, going to war against the Green Lanterns in the Sinestro Corps War. But there was an instance where a member of the Sinestro Corps who had basically surrendered was killed by a Green Lantern. Because of this, not only was the Green Lantern kicked out of the Green Lantern Corps, but the Guardians of the Universe, the ones responsible for creating the Green Lanterns, had basically said, we can no longer allow you guys to run unchecked. Instead, we're going to create something called the Alpha Lanterns. And the Alpha Lanterns are going to serve the purpose of basically policing the police. Now, the Alpha Lanterns answer directly to the Guardians of the Universe themselves, and they're effectively cyborgs, but they're the ones that carry out these internal investigations. But regardless, they're the ones conducting this and trying to figure out what's going on. Because in the middle of all this, John Stewart's basically attacked by someone that he doesn't initially consider to be an enemy, only for the Alpha Lanterns to arrest Hal Jordan. And the implication here is that Hal Jordan is the one who not only killed Orion, but it also attacked John Stewart. And that brings into the equation the idea that superheroes like Hal Jordan are being dominated by the anti-life equation. Now, switching back over to Batman, essentially what happens is with him having his detective skills and basically being able to piece things together and figure out what's going on, because of the fact that these Alpha Lanterns are part sentient, because they still have a conscious mind of their own, albeit half machine, they can still be controlled through means that are insanely powerful. And the anti-life equation has no limit. And so because of this, the implication is that one of these members of the Alpha Lanterns had basically had their will dominated by the anti-life equation. And the result is that either they tampered with the crime scene or something along those lines, Batman seems to figure out what's going on. He's basically snatched up by a boom tube and whisked away to Apocalypse. Again, it's essentially this idea that the superheroes are slowly being removed one by one. Now, what this does is this brings into the equation the idea of the Justice Society of America. Now, the best way to think about the JSA is that they are basically the 1940s superheroes from DC Comics. The Flash, Jay Garrick, the Green Lantern, Alan Scott, so on and so forth. The kicker is this. In 1956, because Barry Allen was introduced as the new Flash, there was no explanation as to where it was Jay Garrick had gone to. And so what DC did is they came along in 1961 and they said, well, see, what had happened was when we started publishing stories about the Flash, Barry Allen, we actually switched over to stories from a new universe. We just didn't tell you. And so what they said was that every story that ever featured the Flash Barry Allen on the Justice League or whatever the case may be, that was all in Earth 1. All the stories that featured like the Flash, Jay Garrick, things like that were Earth 2. The problem with this was that again, when Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, DC had to find a way to basically either justify the existence of the JSA, kind of reconciling the idea of an alternate universe, or if there were no alternate universes, kill them off entirely. And that's what they did. After Crisis on Infinite Earths, the JSA was gone. They basically just vanished vanished from the face of the earth. Now this lasted until 1991 with Roy Thomas, I think it was. And it was basically this story that was done in Secret Origins issue number 31, which is technically volume two. But the idea was that DC came along and said, okay, so any of these old school superheroes that basically have modern day counterparts, a 1940s Wonder Woman, like a JSA Earth 2 Wonder Woman, a JSA Earth 2 Superman, things like that, they're gone. And what they did is they came back and they said, okay, so in this new universe continuity after Crisis on a Infinite Earths, the JSA were actually just superheroes who fought in the 1940s and 1950s, and they've long since retired and the new superheroes took up the mantle. Now, that did not answer the question as to why it was the JSA was never referenced in the origin stories of superheroes as they appeared in the mid-1980s after Crisis on Infinite Earths happened. But most fans just kind of took it. They just kind of said, whatever, we just want to see the JSA come back. This lasted until 1993 and 2006, respectively. 2006 was probably the most important date, just just because of the fact that with Infinite Crisis seeing the return of the multiverse, it allowed DC to basically bring back Earth 2 and to say, here's the newer origin of the JSA in DC's comics. It also allowed a lot of crossing over, different things like that, but Infinite Crisis was largely launched because DC's continuity had managed to just go to absolute pieces within the 20 years of Crisis on Infinite Earths running to Infinite Crisis. But the overall gist of this is that characters like The Flash, Wally West, who's The Flash after Crisis on Infinite Earths due to Barry Allen being killed and the original Flash, Jay Garrick, they were able to cross over, they were able to meet, and it actually resulted in some pretty cool stories. But in this instance, the Wally and Jay Garrick are just kind of going through and, you know, investigating things at the request of Batman, and that's really about it. Any information they can find about the death of Orion, anybody who saw anything, they're basically investigating that. But in the middle of this investigation,
investigation, they're suddenly met with this insanely blinding flashing light only for us to see the return of Barry Allen. Now, this is huge. This was a massive moment in the realm of DC because you remember when it came to everything from Infinite Crisis running all the way up to 2011 with Flashpoint and the New 52, the goal was to basically set the stage. But regardless of how they look at it, ultimately it's this idea that when it comes to Barry Allen, he had been, been believed to have been dead since Crisis on Infinite Earths. We covered that story already. You'll find that story down in the description. When Barry Allen sacrificed his life, it allowed DC to remove his character from the landscape and put Wally West in his place. And we got some really cool stories. And in fact, we saw a lot of the limits being pushed when it came to the Flash Wally West, the kind of abilities they had, different things like that. A lot of that was pushed to the extreme with Wally West. It's one of the reasons why a lot of fans loved his character because things like the Speed Force were created during the run of Wally West. There's just all these crazy things that happened during those stories. But the return of Barry Allen is a big deal because what this does is it sets the stage for the interim Flash stories between this story, Final Crisis, and the start of New 52. It deals with things like the Flash Rebirth, Barry Allen's new origin by Jeff Johns, all these different things that took place and sort of reshuffling his character, changing him around, updating him for the modern reader. These are the kind of things that happened. And so the result is that in this instance, with regards to the return of Barry Allen, as is being told by Jay Garrick to Barry's wife at the time, Iris West, what he basically says is that when Barry showed up, their goal was to actually stop the bullet, to catch the bullet that shot Orion. The problem is they couldn't. They could not catch the bullet in time. And the result is that Orion basically died. At the same time, what we also end up finding out is that where Barry Allen was believed to have been dead following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, what he had actually done is enter the speed force. And from the time Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, right up until this moment, he had been quite literally outrunning death. He'd just been running away from death constantly. Again, it was a pretty significant deal. But what things began doing was moving in the direction of basically taking these major characters out of the equation. Batman was basically teleported away by a boom tube. Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, he was taken away to be put on trial by the Guardians of the Universe for the perceived death of Orion himself and the assault on Jon Stewart. Superman in a massive explosion that takes place at the Daily Planet is basically told by some unnamed person they need to leave this universe and they have to go somewhere else in order to save everything. So it's this gradual stage removal of these various characters who exist out there within the DC superheroes landscape. So it's really interesting and it's really kind of wild because what ends up happening here is we actually end up picking up with this idea of the anti-life equation being quote unquote uploaded to the internet and sent out into the digital space because what it does is it allows dark side to basically use the modern era of smartphones and the internet to spread the anti-life equation around the world. So it's really kind of cool because it feeds very much into this idea of technology. Now, in truth, when it came to Grant Morrison as a writer, this was him saying, well, these are the dangers of technology. You know, anybody could conquer the world. Humanity's too dependent on technology. But the overall gist is that the goal of dark side proves to be true. He successfully manages to conquer the earth. The reason why we find this out is because in their efforts to escape death, both Barry Allen and Wally West run several weeks into the future only to find that the world has basically been conquered by Darkseid. Everybody is under the influence of the anti-life equation and those individuals who try to resist Darkseid never succeed. That in the end, Wonder Woman is one of the superheroes who are under the control of Darkseid. So the question becomes, how did we get from him releasing the anti-life equation to this point in the future and is there any conceivable way to stop it? Okay, so we are getting into Final Crisis and the death of Batman. This is the last part of Final Crisis. Keep in mind, this takes place before Blackest Night, and so I'll try to fit it in as best I can as far as continuity goes with the Green Lantern playlist. Uh, but this story's also been referenced in like Dark Knight's Metal, and it's actually been referenced a few times in the New 52, so uh, I have no idea why it took us so long to do it. But Final Crisis is basically the one of the last major huge crossover events in DC Comics before the New 52 in 2011. I mean, Black Blackest Night, Brightest Day, those are huge crossovers, different things like that. But the first video, and I and I highly suggest you check it out, but if you don't have the time to do it, the first video basically dealt with this idea of something called the Source destroying the New Gods. Originally under Jack Kirby, the Source was just this concept that was part of the fourth world mythos with the New Gods, which were totally isolated from all of DC superheroes. But because of the fact that Jack Kirby left in the 70s and he went back to Marvel and DC started just gradually folding over different aspects of the New Gods, Dark 
Darkseid and things like that into uh, DC's main superhero stories where they would cross over with Superman and different things like that. The origins of the source or the nature it serves has changed over the years. Different writers have taken different roles with it. So there's no definitive explanation on what it is now. We can go with the original Jack Kirby explanation and say the source is just like this wellspring, this massive source of energy where all life came from. But different writers have said, well, the source is an aspect of the presence, which is basically the God of the DC universe, DC's version of the one above all from Marvel. We can take it to basically just say the source is where all life comes from. Now, the idea was that the new gods were basically going to be eliminated by the source. It was going to be DC's way of getting rid of that whole fourth world thing, getting rid of dark side, the new gods, all that kind of stuff. The problem was the animosity between dark side and high father, who was the good guy that led, uh, led new Genesis because their animosity was so extreme. When they died, they continued fighting in heaven. The result was that somewhere along the lines, dark side basically and his forces had gathered the anti-life equation. And the anti-life equation is a mathematical proof that if it is shown to someone will take away their free will. The, uh, the forces of dark side effectively won, but not without dark side being killed in the process, or at least being shot in the process. And so where he was attacked, and of course he had shot Orion, different things that happened, dark side's body had essentially, or at least his essence had basically fallen out of heaven and through the multiverse. When dark side's essence crash landed on earth, he didn't just dissipate. He didn't just die. Instead, he took over the body of just some crime boss somewhere. And then eventually a detective named, uh, named Dan Turpin, who was really just in the wrong place at the wrong time, <laughs> was effectively possessed by dark side. And the result is that dark side's forces who had been reborn in new bodies began coming together and then began biologically modifying the body of Dan Turpin to make it suitable for the body of dark side, just because of the fact that dark side's essence would destroy any physical body of a normal human, just because it's so powerful. Basically what's taken place now is the anti-life equation has been released onto the earth by the forces of dark side. And the result is that everything is just kind of going to pieces. It's really like a last stand in almost every conceivable way. But the story comes from two different perspectives. The first is in the modern day when everything is beginning to fall apart. The second is about a month into the future where everything has already fallen apart. And the idea is that because of the fact that Barry Allen had basically emerged from the speed force, having been revealed to have been alive and been chased by the black racer, who's basically the embodiment of death for speedsters, because it had been chasing Barry Allen, Barry Allen and Wally West just ran as fast as they could to get away from the black racer and ultimately landed a month into the future. In the modern day right now, it's just everybody doing the best they can to stay alive as best they can. Almost every single normal human who was flying on planes or watching TV or on their phone or whatever was blasted with the anti-life equation when it was sent out over every conceivable radio and internet frequency. And so something like 3 billion people exist to function under the whim of dark side. All that's left are whatever superheroes haven't, haven't been killed or captured. And so because of this, a couple things took place. The first was that uh, Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, was basically believed to have killed Orion, you know, one of the new gods who fell to Earth. Of course, we know that that wasn't necessarily the case, but it was believed that that was done by Hal Jordan. He was taken from Earth and he was sent to uh, Oa to be put on trial by the Guardians of the Universe. Batman was just whisked away to another realm and we didn't really know where he went to. He actually ended up going to Apocalypse where he was basically just tormented. And then Superman was whisked away to the 31st century. And so basically anybody who could really do any real measure of good was basically taken away. The only people that you really have left around here are people like uh, Green Arrow and you have like, you know, John Stewart, one of the Green Lanterns of Earth. You've got the Atom, you've got Deathstroke. You got a few people here and there. There's no Superman. There's no Batman. There's no Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. That's really about it. Things have just really kind of gone to pot. Now, jumping into the future and picking up with Barry Allen and Wally West, they actually come up with this genius plan. Their idea is this. Barry basically says that the Black Racer will try to find him no matter where he goes because Barry's supposed to be dead. The Black Racer is an aspect of death itself. The Black Racer exists to take those who are supposed to be dead and bring them to the afterlife, to send them back to their rightful place. The whole goal here is to basically lead the Black Racer on a merry chase directly to Darkseid. And the Black Racer will basically capture Darkseid because he's not really supposed to be alive. Darkseid's essence fell out of heaven. For all intents and purposes, he should be dead. And so he will be captured, basically taken by the Black Racer and then sent to the afterlife. That's the goal of Barry Allen and Wally West. And it's actually really cool the way they end up pulling it off. But for all the other characters that are out there, again, I mean, there's tie-ins to Final Crisis. The biggest problem for the, uh, the Final Crisis tie-ins is that they don't necessarily match up with the story that Grant Morrison wrote. And so there's actually some contradictory stuff that goes on in there. Now, as far as like Oliver Queen, Green Arrow, as far as a lot of those characters go, it's basically just trying to get off 
world as fast as possible or take up refuge wherever they can. I mean, it's literally just these small little areas here and there, these little bases of operations, the Fortress of Solitude, the Justice League Watchtower, things like that. The other half of this is the nature of time itself and space in the sense that because of the fact that Hal Jordan is basically put on trial, what we end up finding out is that one of the Alpha Lanterns has actually been corrupted by one of the new gods. Now, this goes into our run on the Green Lanterns that we do every Sunday. But the idea was that there was an event called the Sinestro Core War. And the Sinestro Core War dealt with a villain Thal Sinestro forming his own Lantern Core, the Yellow Lanterns, which went to war with the Green Lanterns. The Green Lanterns rings were modified so they could actually begin killing. And the problem is that one of the Green Lanterns killed a member of the Sinestro Core who was actually uh, basically giving up, who was surrendering. The result is that the Guardians of the Universe said, yes, you can kill Yellow Lanterns, but only if the Yellow Lanterns are trying to kill you, you cannot kill a person who's trying to surrender. The result is that that Green Lantern was exiled from the Green Lantern Corps, and in response, the Guardians made the Alpha Lanterns to police the Green Lantern Corps. The problem with this is that the essences of the new gods transcend anything that exists, and so they can take over any being so long as it has a biological component. And that's what the Alpha Lanterns are. They're basically cyborgs. And so because of this, one of the new gods named Granny Goodness took over one of the Alpha Lanterns. Now, Granny Goodness has a great big huge history when it comes to DC Comics, but the only thing you really need to worry about is that she's the one who's basically in charge of the Furies, which is basically the elite fighting force of, uh, of Darkseid himself. So again, there's a lot of history there. There's a lot that goes into it, but this story is packed enough with content as it is. We're not going to do a great big huge thing on Granny Goodness in the middle of all this. That's the long and short of it. But the idea here is that with Hal Jordan being exonerated by the fact that he didn't actually commit the crime that he was framed for, it allows his character to go free, but it also provides a 24-hour window in the sense that the universe is, again, falling apart at the seams. And so with, with Hal Jordan basically coming back, with Superman off doing his own thing, Batman off doing his own thing, and Darkseid officially risen to power, basically becoming the character that we are the most familiar with, what this does is it shifts to Renee Montoya. Now, in the last video, I think I had made a statement that Renee Montoya's girlfriend had died. It was actually her partner that had died. So that was my mistake. But the result is that with Renee Montoya at the current moment, she's actually going to serve as an avatar of sorts. What ends up happening is she's basically grabbed by Checkmate, one of the few groups that exist around the world that are trying to stop the entire, you know, collapse of the universe. They're doing a litany of different things. They're trying to get a hold of the Spectre, who's basically the representation of God's vengeance. They're trying to reach out to other universes. I mean, they're literally doing everything they can <laughs> to try to find a way to stop this whole thing. And the idea is that Renee Montoya is basically going to serve as this avatar in the sense that she is going to be a person that's literally going to travel through the multiverse itself and basically just try to grab various superheroes that can come together in an effort to basically stop Darkseid, or at the very least, she's going to serve the point of trying to find another inhabitable universe, I think is the initial place. The way it ends up turning out is because Darkseid ends up getting defeated or ends up being defeated, she ends up grabbing all these supermen together and that it goes into the final villain of the actual Final Crisis story. But the whole idea here is that picking back up with Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart and Guy Gardner and a lot of these Green Lanterns who were traveling to Earth in the intention of saving it, the skewed nature of space itself means the closer they try to get to Earth, the further away it is. So they can never actually get there. You know, it's like where you're running down an endless hallway and the door keeps moving back with every step you take. The other half of this is that with Darkseid officially risen, this begins the process of moving things in the direction of joining with how we saw events turn out a month into the future in the sense that Darkseid basically begins gathering all the humans uh, around Earth, all three billion of them who are under his control and begins moving them in the direction of capturing Earth, essentially. Now, what this does is it jumps into what Superman's doing in the 31st century. Now, it comes across with him meeting with a character named Brainiac 5. And again, Brainiac 5 has been around for a long time. The Legion of Superheroes had been around for a very, very long time. Now, the Legion of Superheroes dates all the way back to Adventure Comics number 247 in 1958, I think it was, and they were actually tied into Superboy. Now, I'm going to give them a little more attention here than we do a lot of the other groups, just because of the fact that either we've covered the other groups or because of the fact that with the Legion of Superheroes, we're going to see them in DC Rebirth. But the Legion of Superheroes was originally introduced really as more of like a Superboy story than anything else. Back in the mid-1950s, the Superboy stories largely continued to fall in line with the idea that it was basically the escapades of Superman, 
when he was younger. And the idea was that the Legion of Superheroes was basically the 30th to 31st century result of modern day heroes, meaning that whether Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman or whoever knew it, when they became superheroes on Earth and began fighting crime, they set in motion a legacy. The Legion of Superheroes has waxed and waned over the years, in the sense the rosters changed and different characters have been introduced, other characters have gone away. The stories that involve the Legion are usually just isolated to the 30th and 31st centuries. And in fact, during Final Crisis, there is a story called the Legion of Three Worlds, I think it is. But the idea is that with Superman being brought to the 30th and 31st centuries, the Legion of Superheroes knows that everything's going to happen. But keep in mind, the existence of this future is contingent on the success of Superman. Because remember, when it comes to the actions of Darkseid, when it comes to this idea of space-time being warped, it's much like a tidal wave. When a meteor crashes on Earth and tidal waves are created, they don't just suddenly show up on the other side of the world. It takes time for them to reach the other side of the world. And that's how this is. This shock wave of space and time being completely distorted, it takes time for those changes to reach the 30th and 31st centuries. And so the idea is that Superman being here really comes at a crux because at this moment right now, Brainiac 5 is vanishing. He's disappearing. The effects of Darkseid's actions are beginning to reach the future. And so what Superman is basically shown is this device that was basically created using the concept of willpower from the Green Lantern Corps in the sense that the Green Lanterns tap into the will aspect of the emotional spectrum. All that willpower is channeled into a device which is rightfully called <laughs> the Miracle Machine. He sees it for a few seconds, but using his x-ray vision and just his general eyesight is basically able to see exactly how this thing is functioned. Now, the whole idea is that with everything basically crashing down around them, with everything coming to almost a screeching halt, what we end up doing is we join up with the arrival of Batman. Now, Batman showing back up here again comes out of the fact that he's been tortured in a lot of different ways. The reason for this is because Batman, despite having no powers, is probably one of the best superheroes in DC Comics. People who hate Batman will hate me for saying that. It's the idea that he can always use his mind to find a way to win. It might take him years to find a way, but if Batman is a piece that's left on this quote unquote chessboard, he will inevitably turn the tide of the game because he'll put his mind to use and figure out how to win. The perfect example of this is the shooting of Orion, one of the new gods who was killed. Batman puts two and two together, takes the bullet from Orion when he originally died, took the element of Radeon, which is harmful to new gods, bound it to the bullet and fired it into Darkseid. The crazy thing about this is that it's a bit of a gambit. It is this instance where Darkseid kind of says, we're playing chicken here. You can fire this bullet, but will that bullet hit me before I hit you with the Omega Beams? Now, the Omega Beams of Darkseid were really controversial in this little bit of a story. Historically speaking, the Omega Beams incinerate whoever it is they come across. For Batman, who's just a guy, he should have been totally incinerated. What DC did here is they basically said, hey, wouldn't you guys want to read a story where Batman dies? But he doesn't really die. He just gets time displaced. That's kind of what happened with this whole particular thing. It was modifying the effects of the Omega Beams just for the sake of being able to have this part of the story. But at the time this story happened, everybody thought he died. This coincides with the arrival of Superman because that was really the only purpose he served. In this instance, it was the Legion of Superheroes, Brainiac 5, grabbing Superman, bringing him to the 31st century and saying, hey, look, in order for you to win, you have to memorize how this miracle machine works. If you don't, everything fails. And so what he did is he memorized the miracle machine and then was sent back. Now, what this does is this begins bringing in and basically laying the groundwork for a story called Multiversity. Now, we're not going to get super in-depth into that. We've covered that already, actually. But it basically gives us these different iterations of Superman, one of which is basically a world where the superheroes all seem to be of African-American descent. There's other ones like the Zoo Crew, where all the superheroes are animals. Man, Captain Carrot. Dude, I love Captain Carrot. <laughs> Captain Carrot's a super bunny. Any alternate version of Superman that you could ever imagine is basically here. But there's only 52 of them because there's only 52 Earths in the multiverse. And so, again, it's kind of cool in terms of how this happens. But the idea is that they are all basically being brought together by Renee Montoya herself, you know, who's basically going through and gathering all these different characters. What this also does is this coincides with the destruction of Darkseid. And this happens by way of Wally West and Barry Allen racing in. Now, they are basically running at the speed of light. Nobody around them is really moving. Everybody's just kind of sitting there. Now, as they begin to get to where Darkseid is and they start to slow down a little bit, that's when we start to get into the idea of characters basically talking, of Superman recognizing that Barry Allen is there, his words reaching them. But keep in mind, they're traveling faster than his words can come out. So basically, by the time they get to Darkseid, Superman's already said his phrase. But the idea is that with the Black Racer coming in, it basically says, I come to all, even you. And 
so this is basically the black racer saying everybody falls to me everybody is going to basically die at my hand if you are dead and you are somehow walking around i will take you back to the realm of the dead but with the defeat of dark side the question now becomes how does everything get set back to normal how do things get restored to the way that they're supposed to be and so what ends up happening is this massive undertaking there's a couple things that go on here the first is that one of the things that we hadn't quite talked about yet was a character by the name of shiloh norman now i do not know how to reconcile shiloh norman and scott free shiloh norman and scott free have both played the role of mr miracle at this point in dc's continuity shiloh norman is mr miracle the idea is that he was a protege of scott free but i don't know how to reconcile those two things meaning i don't know where scott free is <laughs> but the idea of mr miracle is he's basically an escape artist he is the child of high father from new genesis who was basically held captive by dark side with the concept of mr miracle what he basically ends up saying is that there is a symbol that everyone who is captured by dark side wears and it's this symbol that basically ends up saying you are allied with dark side but within this alphabet is also the idea of a symbol that will free people from the control of dark side and that's exactly what happens one of the superheroes named ray who's basically a character composed of almost pure light draws this symbol that basically frees everybody from the control of dark side on earth so it's kind of cool in terms of how that happens but following this is this massive undertaking by all these different heroes and, and even villains lex luther all those characters who exist out there trying to build this miracle machine the problem is that time runs out before they can pull it off and space time itself basically falls apart at the seams everything falls to pieces and so the idea of superman is to basically rush and finish this miracle machine as fast as possible in order to set everything back to the way that it's supposed to be but what we end up getting is almost this out of place scenario we basically end up finding out that the evil behind all this is mandrak now when i say behind all this i don't mean that mandrak orchestrated everything not at all mandrak was just this evil that was out there somewhere but final crisis served the purpose of saying okay so infinite crisis brought the multiverse back how does it work? Final Crisis gave us that explanation. We talked about that before. And so the idea was that with the formation of this new multiverse came these monitors. And these monitors were basically these beings of an insane level of power. And they were designed for the purpose of making sure that the universes didn't cross over. So each of these universes got its own monitor. It was basically DC's explanation of simply saying the monitors exist to make sure universes don't die, but it allows us to continue telling our stories about superheroes fighting supervillains. And so the result of this is that one of the monitors had actually fallen and became a bad guy once he realized that you could begin feeding off the energy between the universes. And so this guy became Mandrak, who was basically exiled and just sat outside of the end of all things, so that when the multiverse basically collapsed and everything died, he would feed on whatever energy was left, and when the multiverse was reborn, he would retreat, and then when that multiverse ended, he would feed, he would feed on what's left. So he would be this being that would just rise to godhood slowly but steadily and be virtually unstoppable. The issue with this is that the sun of Mandrak, who had basically taken over his father's role, was a character named Nix Yotan. And Nix Yotan's story really fed into the lead up to Final Crisis in the sense that the universe he was supposed to be monitoring was totally obliterated through a combination of the actions of Superboy Prime and then another villain, I can't remember his name. But the fact remains that Nix Yotan was basically exiled and stripped of his powers. But with space time fracturing and with things just kind of out there in limbo, Nix Yotan's powers returned. And so what ended up happening is that when Rene Montoya showed back up with all these different versions of Superman that this basically led into uh, to Nix Yotan grabbing all these other superheroes as well. You end up seeing him uh, basically showing up and then you see like the Green Lantern showing up and you see like the Zoo Crew showing up because what we're talking about is Mandrak being almost God in terms of all the power that he has. He seems to be almost unstoppable. The other half of this is that where the Green Lanterns couldn't reach Earth in the time when Darkseid was ruling it and space time was being distorted because of the fact that all of reality has completely shattered they're protected from that that destruction they're there but they're basically just kind of in this giant void and so they're just traveling to where it is that superman's at being brought there by uh, nix yotan and everybody else and so what ends up happening is all these forces of the green lanterns and superman and all these guys end up destroying mandrak but it's kind of disappointing because he shows up for like four panels and then he's dead then he's killed and that's it that's really all there is now a lot of that's covered in tie-ins but remember because of the fact that the tie-ins are so inconsistent i just kind of chose not to cover them we can if you really really want me to but i kind of think the story stands on its own two feet in terms of how it's being told but regardless because of the fact that nix yotan basically says that mandrak was a fallen monitor and that any one of them can end up falling down that path that the monitors 
need to go away. They need to be eliminated and removed from existence because the superheroes need to be allowed to grow, to progress. Now, this was basically DC simply saying, okay, now that the multiverse is back and now the superheroes are aware of them, we are going to allow the superheroes to cross over. And so getting rid of the monitors did two birds with one stone. It allowed DC to get rid of an unnecessary element, something that didn't really even need to be there in the first place. And then it also allowed DC to go forward saying, all these universes are going to start crossing over if we choose to allow them to. And the end, it didn't matter. Two years later, DC rebooted. But the whole fact is that with these monitors uh, basically being viewed by Nick Shuotan as being unnecessary, he literally just starts obliterating everything from existence. All the monitors are effectively destroyed. Nick Shuotan is reborn in human form, and this allows Grant Morrison to grab his character and send him forward into the events of multiplicity. But the last little tale bit of this story told fans that man's not dead. Instead, what ended up happening is that when Batman was hit with the Omega Beams, he was basically sent back to the very early days of humanity, basically to the very beginning of everything. And the result is that Grant Morrison followed this up with a story called The Return of Bruce Wayne. And it basically followed Bruce Wayne making his way through time back to the modern day. It actually gets to the point, I think, where he ends up all the way at the very end of time and the Justice League ends up having to grab him and bring him back. But again, the aftermath of Final Crisis saw a lot of different things happening. There was a Legion of Three Worlds that tied in, Superman dealing with that. There were a lot of cool things that ended up happening. You ended up getting like Batman and Incorporated and a lot of that cool stuff. But anyway, guys, if you want to see that stuff, let me know down in the comment section. Let me know what you guys think. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. And yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.